Chapter One of Isles of Eden. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Isles of Eden by Laura Lee Davidson. Chapter One. June fifteenth. A small green island in a blue lake. Borders of white sand under overhanging boughs. Songs of birds, whir of insect wings and leaping fish making circles in the bright water. Toward all this, Patricia and I are hastening in the green canoe that skims the surface like a bird. Three years, three long war years, have passed since we last saw this beloved land, and, remembered with longing, it had grown to seem but a dream island. But it is real. There it lies unchanged, and there it waits, serene and beautiful, and the long war years seem now the dream instead. Along the shore great clumps of iris wave us welcome, royal and purple and gold. Nearer we come, and nearer, until the canoe slides along the side of a swaying dock, and we step ashore. For very joy, I long to kneel in the little trail that winds uphill through the birches and lay my lips against this moss. I glance sideways at Patricia. Her eyes are bright with tears. Patricia is the lady of the island, and for it she has done a beautiful thing. Years ago she bought this lovely wild place, covered with birches, poplars, cedars, and ferns, and then she let it alone. No attempt was made to clear it or turn it into park or garden, and when the buildings for her camp were made, only the most needed paths were cut, and the woods were left much as she found them. Once a summer, perhaps our neighbor, William Forrett, comes and lifts out the tree that fell in the winter gales and stacks the brush in long piles, coverts from the grouse in the deep snows but the tall, broken stumps are left standing, refuge for the flickers and woodpeckers. The few trails are kept open, that is all, and the island remains a place of waving ferns and whispering trees, the home of birds and small, shy, bright-eyed animals. Green light flickers through the leaves. The ground is covered with innumerable plummy wood plants, trillium, wild sarsaparilla, Canadian mayflower, prince's pine, tall bushes, of round-leaved dogwood stand thick around the little shacks, in spring white, with flat clusters of snowy bloom, in fall hung with the bunches of bright blue berries. This island is the nesting ground and resting place for innumerable birds, warblers, flycatchers, creepers, and waders. Most of the feathered folk of Canada seem to harbor here, and Patricia's determination to see and catalogue them all gives her a busy life. I can never be sure, when walking along any trail, that I am not going to scare away some small fowl she is stalking, and this uneasiness has taught me to go through the woods with the sneaking tread of an Indian. In ten years we have seen the forest change, but change so gradually that we have hardly noticed it, and have never felt any loss of loveliness. We came to dense woods of poplars and birches, with here and there a maple or a clump of basswoods. Now nearly all the poplars, with their long swaying stems and whispering leaves, have fallen, and the white birches along the shores have slipped off into the water. Pine cedars, oaks, and ironwoods have taken their place, but there has never been any season of ugliness, for as each tree died and fell a young one was discovered growing close beside it, and little saplings, long hidden in the underbrush, are now sturdy young trees. Along the middle of the island lies a ridge like the backbone of a giant saurian, and at its peak a large flat rock stands like an altar under the sky. Fringe cedars guard it. Tall mullions stand round it, like straight green candlesticks, tipped with pale yellow flames, and a wild grapevine covers it with a cloth of waving green. There is here one golden hour at the full of the summer moon, where I can stand on the very crest of the rock and look eastward to a broad white disk, rising in the sky of tenderest blue, and then westward to the gates of evening, where the sun has sunk behind long golden bars. The heavens are yellow, rose, green, and violet. The still water reflects the colors like the inside of a shell. The long lake stretches away with all its green islands, and I stand in spirit on an exceedingly high mountain, seeing the kingdoms of the earth and sky, and the glory of them. To the eastward, and a scant half-mile away, lies another island, like a fortress at the entrance to this arm of the lake. It is beautiful at all times, in the early morning, when its sheer cliffs are cool gray and its cedars and pines green velvet against the sky, 
more beautiful at sunset when the afterglow paints the rocks pink salmon and mauve most beautiful by moonlight when a silver shield stands over the black trees and lays a shiny highway across the water almost to our shore this is the home of the doctor the master camper who has taught us all we know of woodcraft and to whom we turn in every perplexity man of cities and universities scientist traveller lover of art it has been his yearly delight to escape from paved streets to the forest trails to pack his tents in dunwich shoulder his canoe and journey far into the silent places when advancing age began to threaten and rheumatism to send premonitory pains he set forth on a last trip found this unspoiled lake bought his island and built here his permanent camp to which to retire when he should no longer be able to follow the trail he is a past master in the art and science of living in the woods he knows where the black bass always bite where the deer are most apt to drink he needs only a canoe and the shadow of a rock to be at home in the wilderness and nothing more than a frying pan and a coffee pot to set up housekeeping there deprived of other means of stopping a leak in the canoe he can mend it with a bacon rind lacking a bowl he can mix you a biscuit in the mouth of the flour sack and having no oven can bake it in the pan he is one of the born cooks who can make you a dinner of nothing at all given a potato and a slice of bacon and with the rumor of an onion in a field nearby, he can turn out a stew fit for the gods of the forest. He is also a finished diplomat. When once in a great while a crisis arises here, perhaps Big John Bolak sends word that his hens have stopped laying, and we can have no more eggs, or Joe Bigsby refuses to bring in our mail from Sark, or Mary Blake, forespent with the multitudinous duties of a farmer's wife, announces that she can make no more bread for the campers. Then the doctor steps carefully into his largest canoe and proceeds to the point of difficulty. He pays a visit of ceremony and, engaging the reluctant one in agreeable conversation, expresses at some length our gratitude for past kindnesses and our hope that nothing will occur to interrupt our friendly intercourse and force us to seek another camping ground. And presently the crisis is over and bread, eggs, and mail are coming through with accustomed regularity. This is the doctor, wisest of counselors, kindest of friends, a rock of defense, and a fortress in times of difficulty or dismay. I passed his island yesterday and saw him sitting alone on the wide porch that looks away along the lake to its uttermost shore. His gray head had dropped forward between his great shoulders. His book lay on the floor, slipped from the hand that hung relaxed at his side. His pipe was out, his eyes were closed and a small bright-eyed chipmunk was seated on his knee. Alas, we fear sometimes that his kindly rain here is passing, and that all too soon our lake will become known to campers, and we will be living on two islands entirely surrounded by a roaring summer resort. Then motor-boats will go snorting about, spoiling the fishing and frightening the herons and loons away to wider waters, and our silence will be broken by boatloads of sports, yelling and singing in the twilight and moonlight not that we have not motor-boats now two of them william foretz that goes fairly well on one lung and henry blake's that seldom goes at all but we think them quite enough our forebodings have been strengthened lately by the news that mrs bigby at the end of the lake is preparing for boarders to accommodate them it is thought necessary for joe bigsby her husband and the boys to sleep in the barn and negotiations halted for a while because joe declared he'd be damned if he'd turn out of his bed for any sports mr bigsby is what we call here a miserable man which means something more than stingy according to william forrett joe bigsby would walk to queensport to pick up a dime so presently the vision of gaining some dollars a week with no more exertion to himself than was involved in watching his wife cook clean and wash for the boarders so it wrought upon him that he consented, and now Mrs. Bigsby is preparing for her sports and spending recklessly. She once passed the night at a hotel in Toronto, so she knows how a table should be set for city folk. Noting particularly the decorations of the dining room, she has laid in vast numbers of paper napkins and extra spoons. Every shelf has been festooned with rose-bordered crepe paper. There are blue and amber salt and pepper shakers, and 
gilt glass sugar bowls and cream pitchers if the boarders fail to come or coming fail to stay the consequences will be disastrous for one way and another twenty seven dollars have been spent in decoration alone we doubt if joe bigsby could survive such a loss two pounds of toothpicks have been added to the supplies the blakes are arbiters of fashion being responsible for this innovation hitherto toothpicks have been homemade affairs each man tilting back his chair after a meal and whittling out his own from a sliver picked from the woodpile but the bigsby's took dinner with the blakes one day and the last course was toothpicks handed round in a decorated china bowl joe confided to me afterward that he had been uncertain about the correct way of helping himself whether with spoon or fork but seeing henry take his with his fingers followed suit and now we all get our toothpicks from town and serve them in china bowls one touch of elegance has been omitted from the bigsby preparation and i have refrained from suggesting it i once saw in the little hotel at frontenac a turkish towel of a deep purplish pink draped over the top of the parlor organ it bore the inscription bath mat in raised white letters i never saw one used thus elsewhere and am inclined to believe that some traveling salesman took it from his sample case and worked it off on mrs black the innkeeper in lieu of board money we wish our neighbors well and are glad to see them prosper but we cannot help hoping that the boarders will find our lake too far from movies or soda fountains and that this one visit will suffice them meanwhile the herons squawk the ducks fly over and the loons swim about teaching their young to dive laughing their crazy laughs turning their gleaming white necks to catch the sunlight and sounding their wild long cries all night when the moon is bright late in the night i hear them call clear yearning and looking up into the bright sky i see two dark shapes beating their way steadily onward and I hear the bat-bat of strong wings striking on the still air. End of chapter 1and in this intermediate season fruit is ripening on every plant the canada mayflowers white bells have fallen leaving small green balls veined with red-brown markings hanging to the frail stems the wild sarsaparillas flower spheres are gone round clusters of jade green berries stand stiffly under the leafy umbrellas and the purple raspberries all over the island are forming their woody red thimbles that no one eats but the birds these last are building nests in every bush and getting ready to build up families in every quiet place and oh how they sing from the moment the first streak of dawn turns the stems of the birches rosy until the sun has gone down behind drapeau's forest the woods are vocal the whippoorwill's day begins at twilight we could set our clocks by the bird that begins his plaint every evening at half past seven his call comes from behind the ice house where he probably spends his days sleeping lengthwise on a branch doubtless if we searched we would find the bunch of dried leaves on the ground that does duty for a nest and perhaps could see the two little balls of rusty red down that will be whippoorwills by and by silent as moths the bird begin their hunting in the dusk calling away to one another through the trees they sound so tired so despairing that i wonder what poor will could have done to set the morning so why they feel he should be whipped so often according to their tone all this chastisement is not likely to do much good poor will must be whipped every evening under every summer moon so long as moons and whippoorwills exist the catbird is an orchestra giving brilliant imitations of every bird he hears he is the thrush with lovely liquid measure the chuckling robin the chickadee piping his beseeching note the vireo the crow after he has sung all their songs he gives his impotent catcall and then trails off into his own beautiful love song hearing him i could swear that every island bird was sitting on the ridgepole splitting his small throat in his determination to get me up and out into the blue june morning the birds rule us with a high hand here we love them and as a reward they almost nest in our hair this devotion has its inconveniences greatly restricting our freedom 
we can't sit on the side porch because a song sparrow is built in a low bush two feet away she endured our presence while the nest held eggs only but she will not feed her young if any one is near i go in and out of my sleeping shack softly lest i frighten the redstart that has her home in a birch nearby i must remember not to slam the ice-house door in deference to the nerves of a red-eyed vireo that has hung her dainty cradle of birch bark in a sumac near and a pair of robins having set up housekeeping under the kitchen eaves i must remember not to pass that way too often these are wonderful fishing days sky a little overcast a gentle breeze rippling the water so that the fish cannot see the line water so cool that the bass are lively and not lurking in the deep pools there is always the same appalling number of articles to be gathered for the morning sport rod reel hooks sinkers dip net landing net bait pail fish killer and disgorger horrid name we push off in the skiff from the dock hidden in a cove where the water maples step out from shore knee deep in the lake where the ferns wave their banners and the monkey flowers grin up at us with their impudent little blue faces my observation of the ways of fishermen is that they bring new and expensive paraphernalia to the lake each summer and then spend hours mending beloved old rods and reels that always break at a critical moment also i notice that they never fish near home if they are encamped at blue bay at the south end of the lake they come north to fish they live at the north they go south far away cows have long horns says our neighbor nora mcculley a variation of the saying far fields are green we catch bass dore perch and an occasional catfish for food and for beauty have the little darting sunfish that light the water like gleaming jewels ours are the small-mouthed black bass a strictly clear water fish taking minnows frogs and even worms a three-pound bass is a large fish and tyros are always consumed with pride when they land one not knowing as does the seasoned fisherman that the one and a half or two pound bass is best for eating and gives much sport poor thing when being caught the big heavy fellows are presentation fish to be bestowed with a flourish on the camp that has had no luck that day fish are skinned here not scaled a cut not too deep across the back just behind the head a slit down either side of the dorsal fin and the skin may be loosened along the sides the head bent over and the whole outer covering peeled off like a glove bringing fins entrails and tail with it thus leaving a clean whole fish with very few bones ready to be rolled in cornmeal and fried and if i cannot catch a fish even patricia who taught me concedes that i know how to cook one for many a season i presented the canadian government with the price of an angling permit and never caught so much as one rock bass anglers to right of me anglers to left of me sat pulling in fish after fish while i had never a bite or if i had one did not know it the few fundamental rules of the game seem simple given waters where fish abound and where one needs only go where fish are sure to be the hand must feel the nibble at the bait when the fish having caught the minnow by the tail is turning it around to swallow it head first when the line has just been pulled under there must be a quick jerk to catch the hook firmly in the victim's lip once hooked the bass must be allowed to run off and play a while lest he snap the leader and get away when tired he should be brought gently to the boat and assisted over the side with the aid of a landing net but there's something the matter with me if a fish ever nibbles i do not know it if someone sees my line shaking and tells me to jerk i jerk too hard and if by some miracle a fish has swallowed my hook away he goes halfway across the lake snapping the leader in his escape now i have given up and am more than content to row the white skiff to the fishing ground where safely anchored i retire and like lewis carroll's beaver sit making lace in the stern the boat swings round and round on her anchor rope the sky arches blue a million dancing lights ride the ripples a fish takes patricia's hook with a leap in the air and a scatter of diamond spray the bass gives that leap in the air trying to shake the hook out of his jaw the doré goes straight to the bottom trying to drag it away and the rock bass fish that nobody wants comes in quietly with the tell-tale flutter of the line that always betrays him once in a great while a boat passes but for the most part we have the lake to ourselves a stretch of blue water reaching on as far as the eye can see dotted with little green islands lying tranquilly at anchor living in the midst of beauty like this 
should do something for the soul, I said idly, and yet I don't believe the people here see it. How do you account for the sordid outlook of the dwellers in places like this? I suppose, answers Patricia, her eyes on the line, that if every sunset reminded you that the pig must be fed and the cow's milk, if every time you looked out of a window you saw the hawks after the young chickens, or the horse trampling the corn, and if you always had to go to bed at dusk in order to get up the next morning at four o'clock to plow, the beauty of it all would not be the first thought in your mind. Perhaps not, I concede, turning my gaze to a group of young birches that cling to the moss-covered bank and lean toward their white reflections in the water. I've never been able to decide whether the birches are more beautiful at dawn, when the sunlight turns them pink, or in the moonlight when they shine like slender white columns in a forest temple. They are like fairy trees at all times and wear a fragile, tender loveliness that appeals the more, perhaps, because it passes quickly, for the birch is short-lived as the lives of trees are measured and marks a phase in the story of the woods. It never seems to belong to the stern forest of the north with their snows and bitter winds, but rather to the hills of Greece. I always imagine that I must just have missed sight of the dry head that slipped round a white stem at my approach. There are many of the clumps of birch still standing on our island. They grow sometimes in pairs, like gateways, and the trails pass on between them. Two of them, near the harbor, guard a little garden that I love. A rabbit's hop would cross it, but it holds all that a garden should boast. Trees, ferns, moss, and fragrant flowers. A great bunch of iris stands between it and the water. Small cedars wall it round. The ground is covered thick with partridge vine and overgrown with small plants which which lift scores of slender racemes that grow out of green rosettes and bear tiny white bells. Every wandering wind that shakes these bells sets free a perfume, like the smell of lilies of the valley. So lovely a plant should have a poetic name, but this is only the shin leaf, named by reason of the healing virtue supposed to live in its leaves, that used to be crushed and made into plasters for bruises and wounds. To the English peasant, every plaster was a shin plaster, hence the name. Year after year these fragile flowers spring up in the self-same place, and every season when we return my little garden is blooming. End of chapter 2Chapter 3 of Isles of Eden. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Chapter 3, June 27th. The regularity of life here is very restful. The coming of birds, insects, and flowers is as unvarying as the return of spring. Almost to the day the first warbler appears, the first spray of goldenrod blooms in the path to the pump. The first great water spider crawls out on the dock. Each summer, when we come back in June, Patricia and I congratulate ourselves and each other on the absence of ants. Maybe there are not going to be any, we hazard. Perhaps our earnest efforts to exterminate them are at last seceding. But one fine morning we detect a thin stream of small black travelers toiling up a table leg toward the sugar bowl, and forthwith the legs of tables must be set in jars of water and kerosene oil, or we open a chest and out rushes an angry horde of large brown insects, each lugging a large fat pupa to safety, and we perceive that the ant season has arrived. Only the rabbits refuse to return with this annual regularity. They have all disappeared. Last summer I am told there were hundreds of them, big brown Canadian hares, with very long hind legs, great furry ears, and bulging black eyes, hopping along the paths or sitting immovable under the ferns. Now I see only one lean, ragged old hare on the path to Henderson's farm when I go over the meadows, and Mary Blake is rearing one wee brown bunny picked up in the hayfield, a tiny thing no larger than a man's fist, that lives in a box by the kitchen stove and laps milk from a saucer like a kitten. These rabbits, wrongly called, are northern varying hares, big long-eared, swift runners, that rear their young in forms, not burrows, and are true fur-bearing animals. Like all fur-bearers, they have two coats, an undercoat, soft, dense, and fine, and an outer coat of long, coarse hairs. It is these outer hairs that turn color with the season. The trappers say that a mysterious disease comes every seven years and kills off all the hairs. 
as no skeletons are found it is supposed that the animals crawl underground to die but the year that the rabbits go the other animals go also for fox lynx martin mink and ermine all depend upon the rabbit for their winter food then the trap lines must be extended many a mile and even so the yield is poor so except for getting muskrats i fear that the hunters hereabout will have a hard winter they all the forts the drapeaux and the bulocks depend on the traps for most of their yearly income they all keep one or two flop-eared nondescript hounds for running the foxes and hares and in good season they make quite respectable sums only our neighbors the little john bolocks will not suffer for they no longer depend on selling skins john is crippled and cannot wander over the countryside any more and young lewis has gone away to the lumber camps the bulock family rejoices in a new house for some years they lived in a one-room barn the sole building left standing on their land after two fires had consumed two previous homes with touching faith they ran the iron stovepipe once more through their wooden room secure in the conviction that as the last fire had occurred at the full of the moon they could not be burned out again although that method of bringing roof and stovepipe together had twice resulted in the loss of every article they possessed except perhaps the stove but all signs fail in certain cases and sure enough the red-hot stovepipe played them false once more the barn caught fire in the time-honored way turning every one babies and all out into the snow thanks to young lewis who drove the river last spring there was this time money for lumber the neighbors held a building bee and ran up the new house in short order while the family lived in an old tent now the bulocks are comfortably settled once more with a fine tile chimney which goes to show that travel broadens the mind for young lewis's mind is at least open to the advisability of providing against a fourth disaster rose bulock the mother grows daily frailer and thinner for life cruelly hard for men here is doubly hard for women last year she had all the work of the farm to do for john went away to war leaving the full burden of the home pressing down on his wife's bent shoulders poor fellow he had little choice the mica mine had shut down the crops had failed and the need of money was dire so patriotism and necessity both urged him on to the training camp rose is not forty but she is an old woman she tills the fields milks the cow fishes cooks sows washes mends and is always nursing a baby many a time have i seen her hoeing the potatoes with an infant on her arm last spring was a heartbreaking season for her poor soul for word came that john had had a stroke on the parade ground and was in the hospital later we heard that he had received his discharge and was coming home then rose turned her family and her cares over to cecily the eldest daughter and began a daily pilgrimage into the station at loon lake through snowdrifts waist-high through mud knee-deep and wind and rain and bitter cold she trudged those long weary miles to the railroad to bring john home she had no horse sometimes a neighbor would give her a lift but not often for in winter few travel that road we used to think she must die on her way her face grew so pinched her eyes so wild after each disappointment anyone living near the station would gladly have brought the sick man out to the house by the lake but rose would not hear of that no she must be on the platform when the train drew in her arm must steady him in the rocking old farm wagon that she would borrow to bring him at last home one day late in march john bulock crawled off the car the wreck of the stout man who had gone away to valcartier three months before now he sits at his door in the sun smoking his old pipe and struggling to his feet to greet me with pathetic courtesy when i climb the hill of the life of camp and training ground he never speaks what did hard discipline mean to him who had never known obedience to another's will what pangs of homesickness did he endure who had never travelled farther than frontenac twenty miles away what fears assailed him when he thought of his woman and the children he had left all this we can only conjecture but i know that to sit beside his own cabin door in the sun to look out over the familiar fields to the lake even if he can never till the ground or hunt or fish again fills him with a measureless content and to rose i know the stroke that saved him from going overseas to the trenches was a gift from the hand of god 
with John's pension that comes regularly, and with Lewis sending money home, the Bulocks are prosperous as never before. Not only are they living in a new house, but they have many comforts, nay, luxuries, never hitherto known. With the first pension check, they hastened to buy a graphophone on the installment plan, and Rose has a new sewing machine. Riches have not, however, made her forget her thrifty ways. The doctor gave her an old tent the other day, thinking it would serve as an additional sleeping room during the hot weather. It was heavily waterproofed and very dirty, but Rose washed it, boiled out the paraffin, dyed it dark blue, and yesterday my eyes were gladdened by the sight of four little bulocks running about in garments made of that old canvas. The boys were getting along fairly well, although their progress was somewhat hampered, but we, Emmeline, was having heavy going, for being at best unsteady on her short legs, the weight and stiffness of her apparel caused her downsettings to be frequent, and her uprising had to be assisted by anyone who chanced to be near. The lines of her gown were exceedingly simple. She looked like a Noah's Ark doll, but she was receiving more attention in her canvas dress than she had ever had before in her short life, and her expression was one of pride. End of chapter 3「Chapter Four of Isles of Eden by Laura Lee Davidson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Four, July first. By the first week in July, the basswoods are in bloom, and the air is laden with perfume and vibrant with the hum of insect wings, for the wild bees make straight for the lindens in flowering time. Our basswoods, lindens, are beautiful big dome-like mounds of waving heart-shaped leaves and dark velvety stems. They are the nectar-yielding trees, and during their honey flow, the bees fly many a mile to fill their sacks. Far across the water I watch them coming like fleets of little ships sailing down the sunshine, and the humming of their wings is a jubilant harvest song. When they sail away, rocking with cargoes of sweetness, I know that our basswood honey will fill the combs in many a hollow tree back in the forest. William Forret is our successful bee hunter. The flight of one laden insect is all he needs to guide him to a bee tree. An unbelievable quantity of dark honey and brown comb comes out of one of these old wild hives, and many a brimming tub and pail have I seen at the forets after one of William's raids in the woods. Like the beads, the redstarts love the basswoods, or perhaps it is the caterpillars hiding under the leaves, or the gnats that dance in the sunshine. Candelita, little torch, the Cubans call the small bird, of shining black and salmon pink plumage, that darts here and there through the branches, a fitting name for the flashing fairy-like birds that light the woods like darting flames. They dash to and fro, they swing for an instant on a twig, ching, ching, Chi, sir, we, swee, swee, they call, with wings and tail outspread, they dance away through the air. There is a redstart family living in a dogwood bush outside my sleeping shack, the nest a closely woven cup of birch bark and leaf stalks lined with plant down, hangs close under the window, and there the mother bird sits tranquil and serene. She is the neatest, most sedate little creature imaginable, dressed in brownish olive with wing patches of pale yellow. Once in a while she takes a short rest, hopping quietly from twig to twig, perching on the window shutter, and twisting her small head round the edge to peep in at me. Her plumage, each feather sleek and smooth, fits like a tight little satin gown. Nothing startles her. Nothing ruffles her sweet serenity. She attends to her duty quietly and conscientiously, and when she has brought out her brood, I am sure each baby redstart will be thoroughly able to take care of itself and will be a credit to her training. Not even the patter of the red squirrel's feet on the roof startles or frightens her, for she knows that she has hung her cradle so far out on so slender a branch that he can never reach it. The red squirrel, or chicory, is as unmoral as a crow. He had rather filch something that he supposes you do not wish him to take than accept the best morsel ever offered. He is a great egg-stealer. Every bird-lover's hand is against him, but he is an agreeable companion, and I forgive him his sins for the sake of his amusing ways. He and little Madame Rufus have taken possession of a bird-house, made at great pains by Patricia for the robins. 
after all her scientific measurements of side and entrance her calculations of height from the ground and exposure to sun lo the tenants are red squirrels and the robins nest where they can the box is fashioned to the side of the ice house and there on her bed of leaves sits little madame rufus peeping at me when i go in for butter or cream she is very pretty with her rust-brown head white breast and slanting bright eyes the young looms are out now and the old birds are teaching them to swim and dive the nests are mere depressions and lumps of mud on the shore and usually two little loons are hatched there but yesterday two old birds came floating down the lake with only one small black head rising between them when they spied our boat one gave a warning cry and in a flash under water went the baby's head first one parent then the other put its head under too were they telling the little one which way to swim he stayed down a long time then emerged far away coming up as is the manner of loons in a totally unexpected quarter the parents swam rapidly to him and down he ducked again underwent their two heads and so they guided him down the lake and out of danger we would not have harmed him we were only minnowing in a pool that was sapphire blue with silver lace trimming every ripple the shallow sandbar where minnows abound when they condescend to appear anywhere lies between two island points where the alders hang over the banks and knotweed points to the sky with small pink fingers minnows are the most elusive things that swim the most erratic and undependable indispensable to the catching of bass and doré they lead us a pretty dance we row to the traditional minnowing place where the water is shallow the sand clean the sun in the right quarter and where by all laws there should be hordes of minnows waiting to be caught there is not one gleam of any small silver scale we row home again discouraged to find shoals of them in the deepest water just off our own deck also a minnow is the most independent thing in nature it will not swim the length of a boat for the most tempting netful of bait ever lowered into the water the net must be gently laid on the sand directly in his way then perhaps he will condescend to linger over it and be caught but even then the descent of the minutest gnat on the water suffices to distract his attention and away he goes past the bait and on to safety but whether we catch minnows or no there is joy in drifting over the lake with its many green islands some large containing four or five acres some so small as to be mere points of rock jutting up out of the water small or large each repeats our island topography and flora each has its high central ridge of rock its backbone its strip of sandy beach its wind-sheltered cove for safe harbor every one has the same vegetation poplar birch maple and cedar though on the smaller islands there may be only one stunted specimen of each tree on the tiniest there will be a bunch of alder on the shore a wild grapevine over a rock some bittersweet a few heads of goldenrod and life everlasting and in the shallows some pink knotweed and a bunch of rushes on almost every islet we have left a woodland fireplace record in stone of one more happy hour in the old days when the lake was strange we would pack a pail with food and go exploring among the islands at supper time the doctor would build an oven two stones against the bank with a flat one laid across them on which over a fire of twigs we set our kettle or if we did not wish a meal we kindled a little blaze a friendship fire round which to sit in talk or contented silence till night fell and it was time to put out the embers and drift home quietly under the stars it is hard to remember that the little red gnome of the safe camp fire skipping so joyously shaking his flaming locks his little brother to the devastating forest fires that terrify a whole countryside i shall never forget my fear when going out of doors late one october evening i saw flames sweeping along the shore from foreheads almost to drapeaux where only a freshly ploughed field stopped the blaze and saved the barns and homestead this camp was safe since a broad sheet of water lay between it and the burning woods but even now when the slope once blackened is again clothed with green where out of the charred ground red raspberries are growing and tiny birches are springing up and where the mauve spikes of fireweed bloom slenderly tall i still see the red of the fire still fancy i smell the acrid smoke and hear the roar of the flames End of chapter four
Chapter 5 of Isles of Eden by Laura Lee Davidson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 5 July 4th. From the Drapeau's house to the Forets runs a trail that I love. I make many a visit to the house by the drowned lands for the pure pleasure of walking along that path. It begins at a fence between the meadow and the woodland, a shadowy line in the clover, starting off bravely. Soon it is a plain track through the tall grass and is a clear cut through the standing rye. On it goes, turning aside round boulders, slipping under fallen trees, the hill, clothed with cedars, pines, and maples, rising on the right, on the left the drowned land, where the stumps and snags of a submerged forest stand in the still water. On goes the trail, through tangles of wild raspberry bushes, under tall sumacs, whose garnet velvet cones meet overhead, on through the sugar bush, where squirrels chatter in the trees, on across a little hayfield and round a tiny stack, on to the fence that marks the boundary of William Forette's land. The rabbits love this path. The hounds use it, passing and repassing many times a day. I climb the fence and enter a hospitable land where a visitor is always welcome, and where he is sure to learn all the news of the neighborhood if he but tarry long enough to rest his hat. Yesterday I made the journey to inquire for the health of little Emmy, the Forette's adopted daughter, who had lately returned from Kingston, where, according to William, she had had her admirals cut out. We are not behind the times here as regards the removal of adenoids and tonsils and other unnecessary appurtenances. Dr. LeBaron keeps a close watch on us and orders us to the hospital when he sees need. Emmy was already breathing well through her nose which he had never done before, and after a prolonged recital of all that had happened from the moment of leaving Loon Lake Station until the return, we passed on to other matters, and I was troubled above measure by the latest gossip of many islands. Ah, me, there is an ugly scandal going the rounds, and, and who should it be about but Cecily, little John Bulock's oldest daughter, Cecily, who is our heroine, and of whom, until lately, we have been so justly proud. When she pulled Charlie McDade out of the lake and saved his life as he was going down for the third time, her name traveled far, even to Montreal, where the papers spoke about her. Youthful heroine of fifteen, resourceful in making rescue, the headlines proclaimed, following with a highly colored account that gave only half the story, but even as written made us proud to claim Cecily as a child of many islands. It was late in March, when the ice was breaking, that Charlie McDade and William Denby started out from Bulock's Landing to walk to Henderson's. Having been born and reared beside the lake, they should have known better, for the ice was dark and spongy, and there was open water along the shores. Sure enough, when they were about fifty paces from land, the ice cracked and parted, dropping them into the lake. The men could not swim, and if they had known how, the cold would have made swimming almost impossible. So down they went at once, clutching at the edges of the crumbling ice, yelling for help. John and Rose Bulock were away. There was no one at the house but the children in charge of Cecily. Down the slippery hillside she ran, catching up a cedar fishing pole as she went, with twelve-year-old Sally May hard at her heels. Out on the tipping, treacherous ice they crept, going as far as they dared. Cecily threw herself flat and wriggled out to the edge, Sally May holding her by the feet. William had gone. She could not find him, but Charlie came up close beside her. She managed to thrust the fishing pole under his armpit and to twist it round and round in his wet clothing, and tugging and straining, the two girls pulled him ashore. Half dragging, half carrying, they brought the frozen man up the steep hill to the house, where they stripped him, rolled him in quilts and deerskins, drenched him with scalding tea, and brought him to life again. Then Charlie, who had known the girl since she was a baby and who has a wife and three children, fell in love, or what is called love, with Cecily. He had never noticed her particularly, and now, behold, he takes her to all the dances, drives her all over the township behind his fast little mare, and is making her the talk of the countryside. Jenny Fort has met them walking hand in hand along the Micah Trail. Mrs. McCulley has heard Charlie begging the girl to go away with him. Black Jack saw him kiss her, beside the Bulex lilac bush, one evening in the moonlight. The men had ought to run him out of the township, declares William Forette wrathfully. 
Cecily done a fine thing, and if she hadn't been a well-grown big girl, she never could have did it. She saved his life all right. It wasn't worth much. And what do you suppose he give her for it? A gold ring. Words cannot express William's scorn. Yes, a gold ring he give her, and them Bulacks as hard up as they be. If she pulled me out of the lake, I'd give her something worth it, a horse now or a cow. Yes, says William, warming to his theme, I'd have took the best cow and drove her right up to the door. I do not doubt William would have made that impressive demonstration, even if he had been obliged to borrow the cow with which to make it. So this is little Cecily's reward for her courage, a tarnished name and an unquiet heart, for all tell me that she looks miserable. No longer is she a gentle, willing little drudge, but a sullen, unhappy girl, with stormy eyes and angry, stubborn mouth, and no one dares to try to reason with her, lest she break away and go with Charlie. Can't someone speak to her mother? I asked, but no one volunteered. For all little John's careful courtesy and all Rose's gentle shyness, no one cares to take a liberty with them. They would resent interference. We feel that outsiders could do little to help. So everyone is standing aside, watching this girl whom we have known from babyhood fight her woman's battle for herself. We are not more moral, nor are we less so, than any other cut-off rural neighborhood. Sometimes we hear that so-and-so's wife has gone off with another woman's husband, or Jack Chose has brought home another man's wife. It is very wrong, we concede. People hadn't ought to do it. But after all, it seems very much a man's own business. That it should be said of Cecily or any child that we know seems different. It makes us pause to think when the danger threatens one of our own. She has always been such a good child, too, her mother's patient little understudy. With Rose forever at work in the fields or driving the wagon to the station, it has been Cecily who has brought up her many brothers and sisters. I scarcely remember having seen her without a baby in her arms, and I have been afraid her slender shoulders would have a permanent sag from the weight of so many heavy youngsters. Now, at fifteen, Cecily is a woman, and all many islands is watching her and whispering about her. I walked along the home trail in altered mood, planning to talk with Rose Bulak whether or no. In their crowded cabin filled with children, dogs, and lounging men, it would not be easy to find opportunity to speak with her alone, but I would make one. Cecily should not be allowed to ruin her life without least an effort on my part to prevent it. Dismal pictures of the girl, deserted by her irresponsible lover, stranded on the streets of a strange city, helpless, starving, suffering, haunted my thoughts. I could not endure them. The sunshine of the early afternoon was gone. A north wind was bringing the rain. Over the drowned lands the herons flapped away, squawking dismally. Out from the stumps along the shore the kingfishers darted, giving their rattling signal, and far away on the lake the loons were screaming as they do before a storm. I pushed off on water that looked like gray crepe, and drifted under a lowering sky. The sun hung like a pink balloon over the drapeau's woods. It threw streaks of rose along the gray water. The remoter islands receded to immeasurable distances, hid in a purple haze. The nearer ones stood out sharply, their shores vivid green, and as the sun sank behind the hill, a drenching fog came down, blotting out everything. End of chapter 5《Chapter Six of Isles of Eden by Laura Lee Davidson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Six, July Eighth. The storm sobbed itself away in the night, and the next morning was fair, with sky slightly overcast and a light wind ruffling the water. True fishing weather, but Patricia, ever sympathetic, seeing my uneasiness, offered to lay aside the morning sport and go with me to Loon Lake to talk with Rose. Beulah, about Cecily. It is a long, hard row, and there is always rough water at the entrance to Loon Bay, so instead of the boat we took the green canoe that lies like a leaf on the water and goes like a flying bird. We slid silently along the edges of the islands where sheer cliffs rise from the water, or troops of small cedars climb the banks. The mullanes were blooming everywhere, growing tall and straight from the cracks in the rocks. It is a constant wonder to me that these small islands, on which one could scrape up hardly two pailfuls of earth, 
should support so many trees and plants but the trees stand thick the ferns and wild flowers carpet the ground and all seem hardy and well nourished certainly the molines lack nothing they stand more than five feet high with silvery sage-green velvet leaves and spikes of pale yellow blossoms candelaria the romans used to call them because of the old custom of dipping the long dry stalks in suet and using them for torches i too think of them as candles in tall beautiful candlesticks tipped with pale golden flames at the north point we came upon the doctor fishing in great content he held up a large doré boastfully and we lingered to admire it and watch him land another fishing is a queer business sometimes the catch will be all bass and again at the same points with the same bait nothing but doré will come up with a hook just now these are all that any one is catching the doré commercially known as the pickerel is a trimly built shapely fish whose color varies in different localities but is usually olive or greenish brown mottled with yellow on the sides a true perch with nothing pike-like about it except perhaps its sharp teeth it is known as the yellow the blue the glass-eyed pike again it is the pike perch the salmon or the jack salmon but in canada it is the doré the golden one it loves deep pools and cold clear water and comes to the shallows only at night when its great glassy eyes help it to find the minnows and other small fish that are its prey the doctor sat pulling in doré after doré while patricia eyed him wistfully she loves to fish i could hardly bear the mournful glances she threw over her shoulder as we turned away she was however somewhat upheld by the hope of seeing a pileated woodpecker that william forette reported as being somewhere in bohlock's woods this great woodpecker cock of the woods greenish black marked with white with its flaming red crest long bill and strong hooked claws is seldom seen here in summer in winter when the trees are bare it comes into the clearings but at the approach of spring it retires into the fastnesses of the deep forests to see this northern chief of his tribe now is something for any bird chaser to boast of as patricia landed me and then crept along towards the woods i prayed that she would find him our trip was fruitless patricia did not see the woodpecker and rose had taken the children a burying far across the hills so i could not warn her about cecily jason henderson was sitting outside the house in earnest conversation with john a conversation that broke off abruptly at my approach i wondered idly what subject could be so engrossing and hoped it had nothing to do with the foreclosure of a chattel mortgage poor john's usual financial crisis jason greeted me with a polite query and how is your good health to which i made the prescribed answer thank you not too bad after a few moments conversation he bowed himself off stepped into his boat and rowed away jason is one of our leading citizens and reeve of the county he is also the best dressed man round many islands and his light flannels silk shirts and white buckskin shoes taken in conjunction with a lofty manner are somewhat exasperating to the rest of us but i rejoice in his fine raiment and assured air knowing them to be outward signs of success in a hard struggle no one will ever know what torture and fear jason's mother rebecca henderson suffered at the hands of her lunatic husband before jason was old enough to come to the rescue the neighbors tell of the bitter nights when she and her young children escaped into the snow rebecca with a baby at her breast and of how gilbert henderson was heard hunting them up and down through the woods murder in his crazed brain they tell too of the cruel work to which he drove them at threat of the lash and the terror and starvation of the household no one will ever measure the courage which animated sixteen-year-old jason when he defied the crazy giant took over the management of the house and farm and began the fight for freedom nay for life itself the constable and neighbors came to his aid gilbert was judged a menace to the community and sent to the asylum at frontenac and jason and his brothers began their fight gradually the place improved mortgages were paid off fields were tilled cattle and horses bought the mother lost her terrified air 
the children began to smile. The old house, nestled in the lovely curve of the bay, received a new coat of white paint with bright blue trimmings. Roses began to bloom around the doorway, and a vegetable garden appeared. Now the farm is well stocked and flourishing, but Jason has told me that never in the darkest day, when work was overwhelming and labor not to be had, did he let his sisters help in the fields. Work like that is too hard for girls, he assured me. So Jason is now one of our prosperous men, and I learn from bankers and shopkeepers in Queensport that his word is as good as another man's bond, and that he can get credit anywhere and for as long as he needs. Old Gilbert lives at home now, shorn of his strength and pronounced no longer dangerous. The memory of the asylum remains with him, nor has he forgotten that it was Black Jack Beulah, mighty in strength, who had to be called in to subdue him and take him off to the train for town. On his return Jack tried to make friends again, offering Gilbert his hand, but the old man refused it, drawing himself up to his full height and eyeing Jack austerely. Every dog should shake his own paw, he said, as he stalked away. Gilbert does no work but ranges the farm, a shaggy, shambling, sinister figure that none of his family seems now to fear. When mealtime comes, he sits at the door, like a heavy, fierce animal, waiting to be fed. Having eaten, he rambles off again to appear suddenly in unexpected places. Usually he is sullenly silent, but sometimes he talks, and his talk is always of religion, for Gilbert is a great Bible reader, and when in a communicative mood, goes deep into questions of theology. What is the sin that can get no forgiveness, he asks, and again, why did Job bemoan himself? What become of the lost tribes of Israel, he demands, becoming very scornful and irate when I can give him no answer. I'm a great sinner, he assures me. The chief of sinners I be. Will the Lord burn me for it? When I can find nothing to say, so uneasy does his wild air make me, he wanders off muttering. Sometimes I wonder, looking after the huge, slouching, jeans-clad figure, whether there was some crime unspecified by anyone, the memory of which stirs now and again in the vague thoughts of this man with wild eyes and shaggy beard what scenes of torture and violence may once have passed in that now peaceful house before Jason Henderson took command of his father. While waiting for Patricia, I decided against speaking to John Bulock about his daughter and her folly. It would have been cruel to leave the helpless man to brood all day on the ugly scandal about Cecily, his favorite. Also, I was alive to the danger of starting a feud in this neighborhood, where guns are so handy and passion so quickly roused. So we came home, scudding before a brisk wind that lashed the water into white-capped waves, and found two large doré laid carefully on the ice for us, mute evidences of the doctor's care. End of chapter 6「July 11th. By the second week in July the birds are holding high carnival, singing to split their throats. Chief among them is the song sparrow, with his brown-lined head, striped waistcoat, and onyx scarf-pin. He is the most pendable of our singers, the first to begin in the morning, the last to stop at night. In rain and sunshine and cold and heat he chants, and his songs are as brilliant as the canary's trills. Vireo, redwing, catbird, goldfinch, or thrush all come and go, but the song sparrow sings to us always. Each sparrow has a song all his own. I can distinguish the solo of the bird that lives near my shack from that of his brother whose singing tree grows near the pump, for their songs are quite different. One is practicing diligently in a basswood now, trying a phrase over and over with one note always just a bit flat and an interval just wrong. I commend his perseverance, but I wish he would go off to the end of the island until he has mastered his theme. These small birds spend much of their time on the ground slipping about through the fallen leaves, and are the most energetic fighters. When one chases another away from a choice morsel, 
the sounds made would suggest that two good-sized animals were rushing through the brush. I'm always creeping up to one of these combats, thinking that I shall see at least a rabbit, and, behold, it is only two tiny birds fighting over a worm. In and out of the great patches of juniper they hurry, round and round the ferns, till the unfortunate quarry either is caught or has escaped. When the two enemies fly up to two branches and fling forth songs of triumph, or defiance. The juniper or ground cedar with its dark blueberries and spreading feathery branches lying close to the ground is an ornament to the islands. I always want to lie down on one of the flat, fragrant mats that look so soft. Green mattresses, but having fallen into two or three, I know that the juniper is not so soft as it looks, and that I should not lie there long, for every branchlet is sharp as a spear. Between this island and the next is a narrow strait, navigable at high water in the spring, but usually only a still lagoon, where tall stumps stand in the water, homes for the martins and tree swallows, broad leaves of the spatter dock, the cow lily, spring from the mud, their big golden balls held stiffly erect on long, thick stems, and cattails rustle in the wind. Every little pool stages a mimic water carnival, for these same pools are alive with insects. Skippers hop up and down on the surface, tiny hydroplanes, black boat-shaped beetles, the children's wishing bugs dart to and fro like small armored cruisers, and once in a while a tadpole, wicked, lurking submarine, rises suddenly and swallows up a small live watercraft, while overhead sail the blue dragonflies, the airplanes of the fairy navy. Water maples stand with their feet in the lake, waving silvery-green banners on coral stems, while here and there a red branch flames like a scarlet sash thrown across a green satin gown. The water maple is one of the loveliest trees, graceful and alluring. A woodchuck waddles down to drink, shaking the brakes as he pushes through. He is very fat, with a brownish-gray back, short bushy tail, and rusty brown breast. His flat head and beady black eyes have a surly look that wins him no friends. He dips his black muzzle in a shallow pool, then, catching sight of me, turns and runs up the bank with astonishing agility, and goes off up the gravelly slope to his burrow somewhere on the hillside. Groundhogs are not popular here. Every man's and every dog's tooth are against them. Beaver, the drapeau's old hound, has hundreds of dead woodchucks to his credit. The poor animal is harmless so far as eating vegetables in the garden is concerned, although no one hereabouts will believe that, but his burrows in the fields are hidden pitfalls for the farm horses, and many a good nag has broken a leg in the woodchuck's front door. Here on the island there are no horse's legs to break, and our old woodchuck lives on unmolested, somewhere near the sundial, whence he waddles out every evening at sunset for a drink. No one hunts him, he is a friend of the camp, and a family of baby woodchucks lives under the side porch, coming out often to sit in the sun. They are the most comical of all young creatures, very solemn and very fat. Long shadows begin to fall across the still lagoon. A thousand lights dance on the water like tongues of flame. Across on the western shore a field of ripening grain lies pure gold in the afternoon light. Through a gap between the islands a rowboat is coming, threading its way carefully along the narrow channel. Twisting along between the stumps, a man at the oars throws me a good day and a flashing smile as he passes. It is Eli, the peddler, taking a short cut from the main lake to the bay and for its house at the drowned lands. His skin is so dark, his hair so black and crispy curling, that the first time I saw him, sitting beside the forest's door with his great pack beside him, I took him for a Jew but he is a Syrian. Was there ever so strange a country as this? Here, beside our northern lake, under the shade of our northern pines and sugar maples, sat a young man from Syria. He is a fairly constant visitor, walking the country in summer with his pack of machine-made laces, coarse cotton embroideries, cheap trinkets and glass beads. When he is near us, he stops by the forets, and to pay for his board he helps with the haying or the garden. His first name is Eli, his last so unpronounceable that after one or two attempts 
Jenny Forrett, with her strong common sense, christened him Peddler, and we let it go at that. He's built a raised platform around a young maple that stands near the door, flattening and turfing it over and placing a box of boards around, so that the tree stands in a grassy elevation, some eight feet square and two feet from the ground. They plant trees so in my father's garden, he said. When I asked, where is your home, he answered, Damascus. Have you ever heard of that place, he inquired. I alone could answer yes. Is it a big town, asked Jenny, with perfunctory interest. As large as Queenport, for instance? Then Eli launched forth in halting English to tell of the glories of his home, of the gardens, the fruit trees, the flowers of his native land, of the long journey hither, of the uncle with the shop in Montreal, and of the business he, Eli, meant to have when his apprenticeship was over. The talk around the maple tree swung back to the fishing and trapping, to the sums paid for muskrat skins last winter, and the price of turkeys at the fowl fair in the fall. I did not hear it, for my thoughts were far away in Damascus, not the city Eli knows, but a dream city that I shall never see. Damascus, with its walls and seven gates, its mosques and towers, its bazaars, and the tomb of Saladin. Far in the dimness of half-remembered things, a name was rising in my thoughts. Eliezer of Damascus. Night, starlight, voices, and an old man standing beside a tent. It was Abraham, talking with God. What wilt thou give me? he was asking seeing I go childless, and the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus. To me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is my heir. Then came an answer and a promise. Look out now, and tell the stars, if thou art able to number them, so shall thy seed be. My thoughts swept forward full a thousand years. A chariot with horses stood at the door of Elisha. I heard a sick man's tones, angry and charged with bitter disappointment. It was Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Syria, who was speaking. Are not Abana and Farpar, rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? he asked as he turned away in a rage. Again I saw a vision, nearer to the city, nearer to us in time. A blind man stumbled along a white road in the glare of the Syrian sun. His eyes were open, but he saw no man. His companions led him by the hand, in through the city gate, and I followed them along the street called Straight, to the house of Judas. I saw the sightless one sitting there in the piteous leisure of the blind, and knew that he was hearing over and over the voice that was saying, Saul, why persecutest thou me? I knew also that out of his darkness the blinded one was asking the question of the ages, Who art thou, Lord? And again, what wilt thou have me to do? End of chapter 7 Chapter 8 of Isles of Eden by Laura Lee Davidson This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 8 July 15th The goldenrod is blooming now, waving its plumes in all the paths. Time was when the first sight of it struck a pang in my spirit, for it seemed to be warning me of the approach of fall. But now I know it to be only the summer goldenrod, an early bloomer, and welcome it. The wild cherry tree that hangs over my sleeping shack is weighed down with ripe fruit, and the birds are going wild over it. The robins, great heavy fellows, cannot perch on the slender twigs, so they stand on the roof and jump for the cherries, falling back each time with a thud. They are so busy and so greedy that they have no time to sing or even to chuckle. The lighter catbirds and orioles perch on the branches. From twig to twig they hop all day long, eating away. Even the downy woodpecker fairly lives in my cherry tree when the fruit is ripe. I've never seen him eat a cherry, so perhaps he is after some insect that infests the trees in fruiting time. High shad bushes are bearing too, slender, tall shrubs hung with rose-red palms. How the birds love them! Indeed, with all this fruit waiting to be eaten, and all the nestfuls of fledglings begging to be fed, the birds are having a busy time. Fat red raspberries are ripe too, all through the brulee, the burnt lands, 
and we go berrying when the blazing Canadian sun will let us. Yesterday, returning from the berry patch, we passed the Drapeau house, and there in the doorway was Mrs. Drapeau spinning. She was standing before a great four-foot wool wheel, drawing off the yarn that would be knit into socks during the long winter evenings. The sight of her fired Patricia with desire to own a spinning wheel also. It is too late to learn how to use it this year, but Mary Blake has promised to save us a fleece next spring at shearing time, and Mrs. Trapeau will teach us then. It is not very long since all the women here put aside their spinning, and there must be many old wheels tucked away in the lofts and attics of the farmhouses. Indeed, I am told that there has been a revival of the industry since the war and the high tariff have made it more profitable to spin the wool at home than to export it. Mary Finbar, who has the big store at Queensport, tells me that there has been a sudden demand for the heads of spinning wheels, and she has sold more in the last six months than for many years. So the wool is being carted again on the worn old carters, and twisted again into long rolls, pinned with a hawthorn spike. The thread is being drawn from the spindles and the loom set up for weaving the thick warm blankets that are well-nigh priceless. Mrs. Swanson at Blue Bay told me of a wheel we might buy, and this information gave me excuse for one of the trips I love, for now and again I have a longing to get off the island and go a-visiting along the roads of mainland. I like to stop at the farms to get news of the crops, to hear how the hay is looking, how many chickens the minks and foxes have left us, and how many young turkeys escaped drowning in the wet meadow. I want to hang over the fences and watch the men swing scythes and hear some forehanded farmer boasting. Our tame hay is all in. We'll cut the march grass tomorrow. Hay is our staple here, and the subject of most of our conversation, and many a time have I heard the story of a little country girl who went to a party in the city, where she sat silent and neglected, hearing the other children talk of dances and the movies and a hundred things unknown to her, and of how at last she brightened, and nothing daunted, broke into the conversation with the query, "'How's hay?' I packed a dinner pail, stepped into the rowboat, and started off down the lake. That dinner was an unnecessary thing, carried only for the joy of eating by the roadside, for I knew that however late I reached Mrs. Swanson's house, a dinner would be awaiting me. Along the side of the island I went, through the narrows between this land and Blake's, past the long shore where the water maples beckon and white birches lean over to see their reflections, past high cliffs with ferns and little cedars growing in the crevices. The boat was beached on the sand, I climbed a steep hill, crept under a fence, and my walk began, uphill and down through groves of maple and hemlock, by the shore of ponds, over small bridges, the road wandered on. A chipmunk skipped along the top of a fence, his cheek pockets bulging with corn filched from a nearby barn. His tan-colored back was marked with the long brown stripes left by the old squaw's fingers when, according to the Indian legend, she tried to grasp the father of all chipmunks and failed to hold him. How pretty he was, and how agile! I hope he will escape all owls, hawks, and traps, and live on, forever joyous and forever young. On the topmost twigs of the poplars, gold finches are swinging, spots of shining yellow against the blue. They are the most charming little birds, so fearless and so friendly. They flutter out over the lake with a dancing butterfly flight, twittering and calling in gentle coaxing tones. In nesting time they hang on the heads of thistles, busily plucking off down for lining for their nests. They perch on the mullines and gather seed for every standing weed, working energetically, their black caps set perkily over one eye. Gay little birds, their whole life seems a joyous holiday. Mrs. Swanson's land stretches back from the road to beautiful Blue Bay, a long arm of many islands. She was burned out this spring, and now, instead of the comfortable house she lost, she lives in a rough two-room board shack with bedrooms in the loft. Fire is our great menace here. A puff of smoke against the sky sets telephones ringing all along the line. As the message goes from house to house, so-and-so's house is afire. Women come running out of the kitchens, little boys run down the roads, men stride across the fields, it is seldom possible to save the burning buildings. All the firefighters can do is prevent the flames from spreading to barns and 
haystacks, but they fight valiantly. When Mrs. Swanson's house burned, the neighbors came from far and near, but nothing could save it. Only a little furniture was carried out, and she lost most of the treasures that meant home to her. The feather beds her mother had stuffed, the beautiful old patchwork quilts, the blankets spun and woven from the wool of her own sheep. It was a heavy blow for a woman no longer young. I marveled at her courage in bearing it. When the last flame died away, she went to the next farm, staying there while the men ran up this little shack as temporary shelter. I never grow used to the celerity with which these people build houses. In a week this roof was on, and Mrs. Swanson had moved back on her own land with only a great black pit and some charred beams to mark the place where the old houses stood. She has furnished this uncomfortable little cabin with barest necessities, beds, chairs, a table, a few dishes and pots and pans. All her cherished china is gone, but she gives me tea and the new thick cups with as fine a hospitality as ever. After a while, when the insurance is paid, she will build a new and more commodious house, and this little shack will serve as kitchen and shed. Meanwhile, this makeshift for a house is neat as hands, even Mrs. Swanson's hands, can make it. Her bread is as light, her butter as sweet and golden as ever, and she has taken up life again with courage. What furniture was saved is all around the township, waiting for the building of the new house. One neighbor is keeping the piano, another the sofa, another the old mirror with the gilded frame that came out from England with her mother's wedding furnishings. It was a kind of shock to me, that fire, Mrs. Swanson told me. It seemed strange to be sitting on a stone by the roadside, seeing my house burn down for my eyes. The neighbors was all very good to me. They worked and hauled and fought the flames so long as they could. But the young ones was a laughing and joking while they worked, and my house a burning. There was a great tin of maple syrup in the cellar. They found it boiling away on the hot stones, and they cooled it, and pulled it, and made maple candy, and had a great frolic. They didn't mean to be hard. They was just young and having a good time, but it seemed like I couldn't abear to hear them laugh. So I went off to the barn and sat down in the straw, and put my head against old Bess, and there I stayed till they all went home. I was grateful, but it seemed I couldn't stand to see the young folk frolicking while my home was burning. Gradually she will cease to miss her old belongings, but I fear she will never be reconciled to the loss of the old clock with the picture on the door that told the time to her father and to his father before him. I miss its loud tick, she said. It was company for me. After midday dinner, we brought out the little car from the barn and rattled away across country to the farm where the spinning wheel was waiting. An old man with a long white beard sat by the door. He looked like a friend of Noah. He was wagging his white head and saying, What? 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 Over and over. They call him Tom What, although his name is something quite different. The wheel had belonged to his wife, long dead. It was no good to him, he said. None of his daughters could use it. I might have it and welcome. No, he would put no price on it. I might pay him what I thought it was worth. A maddening habit of the people here that results in my paying twice as much as I had intended, for fear of not giving enough. We bore the old wheel away in triumph back to the house, then on to the shore where we loaded it on the waiting skiff. Then I drifted down the lake in the sunset, going slowly, for the boat was top-heavy with its cargo. It was a shining still evening, with every tree, rock, and overhanging bush reflected as in a mirror. The driftwood along the shore met its picture at the waterline, object and reflection doubled to look like skeletons of giant crawfish, long lizards or huge spiders and crabs. The purple martins were flying low, flocks of them, going home to sleep in the dead trees of the drowned lands. Every evening they wheel out over the lake with twittering cries, little dark shapes against a painted sky. When darkness falls we hear them still twittering and talking together while they settle for the night. End of chapter 8、Chapter、9 of Isles of Eden by Laura Lee Davidson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 9 July 18th 
this has been a day of small disappointments and vexatious incidents a day of high hot winds that rocked the trees tearing off bunches of leaves from the poplars and long white streamers of bark from the birches of hard paddling against contrary gales of no mail when there should have been letters at the farm and of no eggs when eggs had been promised the sootiest chimney of the camp fell and had to be set up again and the pump is out of commission we draw the water with a small hand pump perched on a high cliff to get the long lead pipe down into the deepest clearest part of the spring-fed lake the pump must stand on a platform built out some distance from the bluff and hanging over the water the front of this platform is propped on two long cedar poles stuck in the crevices in the rocks and a more insecure-looking contrivance was never made the pumper stands well out in the air and pumps and pumps while the long poles swing and sway occasionally as happened to-day something goes very wrong with the pump's inner mechanism and the water will not rise and no feeding nor coaxing serve to bring up a drop then i am assured by patricia master plumber on the island that the creature demands a new washer comes then a call for wrenches hammers screws and i run obediently to and fro between bluff and house with tools always bring the wrong one for there is a lesion in the organ which serves me for a brain that makes all wrenches look alike to me finally i hit on the one required and then with mighty twistings of nuts and turning of screws the inner works of the pump are disclosed and a new leathern ring is inserted Today we were standing well out over the lake when with a triumphant jerk patricia opened up the valve and a small metal disc rolled merrily away down the face of the cliff and into sixty feet of water with a spiteful plop we gazed after that indispensable bit of iron with stupefied faces it will take weeks to get another from toronto and meanwhile we shall have to climb wearily up and down steep steps to the lake lugging pails even patricia's serenity was ruffled i being the more excitable member of the firm had lost mine early in the day so we were sitting in silence on the wide veranda composing our spirits while watching the stars step out one by one to look down at their reflections in the water across the lake we hear the priest father polme singing in the starlight as he paddles his canoe home to the doctor's island a la claire fontaine is the song plaintive and tender that keeps time so perfectly to the rhythm of the paddle over and over comes the refrain lui ya long temps que je t'aimais jamais je ne trobi erai athol Pulmes came to visit the doctor ten years ago a boy of seventeen just graduated from the college of st hyacinth where he had spent all his motherless childhood in the care of the priests as his mother had been the doctor's friend the boy became doctor's ward during the summers here year after year he came back from the university from the law school from the seminary of st augustine and from the town far up on georgian bay where he is assistant priest in a large parish first it was a happy boy with black hair and laughing eyes who went paddling about over the lake in his cranky little cedar canoe a quaint figure in his preposterous camp clothes topped with a cherished old felt hat the summer after summer parted with one and another of its qualities color shape brim crown until at last it was a mere band of felt stuck round with fish hooks and with a black squirrel's tail standing gaily up behind next it was the steadier student then the seminarian last the young priest always smiling always ready to help us always honest and kind and brave for a year or two we thought and he did that the law would be his profession indeed he began to practice it but he was not happy was restless uncertain unsatisfied until one day beside a little friendship fire we had built on one of the islands he told me that the call to the priesthood had come to him clear imperative not to be disregarded and he was off to st augustine to begin his studies long we talked quietly he waited his great decision i can still hear the shake in his voice when he assured me that the life of a parish priest in this bleak country is a shining destiny 
and the turning of many to righteousness, the goal of man's highest endeavor. And I think I see again his eager eyes, in which shone the joy of the great adventure. After his ordination, Father Polmes was sent to assist an old priest in a parish that lies on the very ground where the first French missionaries labored and attained their crown of martyrdom. The people in the parish proper are Canadian, of course, but when Athol Polmes crosses the river Natawasaga, he treads in the very footprints of the fathers. There lies the village at Tuasha where Père Le Caron planted the cross, and where Bribaf, the soldier saint, labored and prayed. Across the narrow strait, and near the entrance of Mashatash Bay, lies Christian Island, the Jesuits' Isle St. Joseph, last stronghold of the remnant of the Hurons, and on it is Fort St. Marie, Canada's sanctuary of silence. There in 1656 the missionaries gathered what remained of the Huron nation. Their pestilence well nigh exterminated them, and from thence they were driven on by their terrible foes, the Iroquois. There are no Hurons there now. The few descendants of that vanished people are at Indian Lorette, near the city of Quebec. It is the Ojibwes that live now on the sites of the ancient villages with the strange old names, Osasami, Karahoha, Atuasha, and Kaik, the bad town. It is like listening to a page from Parkman's histories. When Father Polmes tells us of his work among the Indians, and of his Ojibwe friends with the French names, Mose Laramé, Paul Vasseur, Félix Dusson, André Copacag, and of the plague, this time the flu that decimated the villages. Through that terrible time he worked night and day in the parish and across the river, nursing the sick, gathering the orphan children and taking them to the convents, administering the sacrament to the dying, burying the dead. It was the shadow of our stout young priest who came back to the lake that summer. He appeared bringing two little black-eyed, bullet-headed French boys, and announced that he had adopted a family. The mother had died of the flu. The father, feeling that his end was also near, sent for the priest and laid his responsibilities, in the form of five small children, on the twenty-five-year-old shoulders of Father Polmes, and then, with a mind at ease, made his preparation for death. The three younger children, little more than babies, were lodged temporarily with distant relatives. The two older boys were brought to camp, where their manners, minds, and morals could be under the watchful eye of their guardian. If those two little French boys do not turn out well, it will not be by reason of injudicious indulgence on the part of Father Polmes, for the care and the rigor of their training were the joys of the onlookers. The little boys adored him, and were forever at his heels, like two restless terriers. They learned to handle a canoe, to swim, to fish, to be good youngsters, and, incidentally, good sports, for Athol Polmes believes devoutly in the educative value of life in the woods. Once only I saw them in disgrace. They had taken out a canoe against orders, and had upset themselves in deep water, making it necessary for their guardian to leave the reading of his office and go out to pull them in. They were terrified, and their plight, as they were dragged in shivering and wailing, might well have softened the heart of a weaker disciplinarian, but their punishment was prompt. They had been guilty of disobedience in taking the canoe, guilty also of imbecility in skylarking in it, when the danger of such behavior had been fully explained to them. They were sent off to bed at ten o'clock in the morning, and his reverence returned to his devotions with a clear conscience while the boys peered out at a world of woods and waters from the seclusion of their tent. I'm sure that somewhere in the writings of his heroes, the first missionaries to the Indians, those diaries and reports made for the eyes of their superiors across the sea, narratives of faith and suffering, combinations of mysticism and shrewd, kindly common sense, Father Polmes finds wise counsel in the training of disobedient little boys. Francis Parkman, from whose history we learn most about the first French missions, had no love for the Church of Rome, scant patience with recitals of miracles and visions, but he gives unstinted praise to the devotion, faith, and courage of the missionaries, Le Jeune, Jean de Brebeuf, Garnier, Isaac Rogues, Lalamont, Antoine Daniel, and many others. 
a life sequestered from social intercourse and remote from every prize which ambition holds worth the pursuit, or a lonely death under forms perhaps the most appalling, these were the missionaries' alternatives, he says. Their maligners may taunt them, if they will, with credulity, superstition, or a blind enthusiasm, but slander itself cannot accuse them of hypocrisy or ambition. Not content with their work among the Hurons, surely arduous and thankless enough, they long to carry their message even to the bloodiest, fiercest of the nations. They burn to do, to suffer, and to die, and now from out a living martyrdom they turn their heroic gaze toward an horizon dark with perils yet more appalling, and saw in hope the day when they should bear the cross into the blood-stained dens of the Iroquois. It is scarcely necessary to add, says Parkman, that signs and voices from another world, visitations from hell and visions from heaven, were incidents of no rare occurrence in the lives of those ardent apostles, and we read that in the winter of 1640, when they were with the neutral nation, Brebeuf saw in the heavens the apparition of a cross of fire standing over the country of the Iroquois. He told his vision to his companions. What was it like? How large was it? They asked him eagerly. It was great enough to crucify us all, was his answer, and we learn that from that day they set their faces toward the land lighted by that flaming cross, knowing what their fate must be, rejoicing that they were counted worthy of its agony. It is on these writings that Athol Polmaez ponders, as he walks the ground they baptized with their blood. It is their example that fires his spirit as he goes to and fro in his parish. He is nearing home now. I know it by his songs. A moment ago it was Malbro zen va ten ger, then O Canada, ter de nos a you. And in this national hymn of Canada, the song with the marching rhythm, his strong clear voice rings over the water. Silence. The canoe is nearing shore now. I wait. Under the starlit sky the lake lies dark and still. Then clearly, reverently, came the words of Brebeuf's great hymn. Vexilla regis produnt, fulgit crucis mysterium, o cruce ave. The banners of the king advance. The mystery of the cross shines forth. Hail, o cross! and with the last strains the canoe slips round the point, and Father Polmaze goes in to rest. End of chapter 9this is the quiet time in the woods. The joyous chorus of bird voices has gradually died away, and there is no more singing except a few trills at sunrise, for the birds are all busy feeding their young. They hop about from twig to twig, long worms or wriggling insects hanging from their beaks. They slip through the thick foliage, a leaf wags where they go, and the faint wheezing cries of nestlings stop suddenly as a juicy morsel is thrust down a gaping bill. The catbird's note now is a peevish, kittenish mew, and the robins give only hoarse chuckles while they plunder the wild cherry trees. The chadberries have turned a dark purple, and the birds and I contest the possession of each laden bush, but we need not quarrel. There is fruit enough for all. I cannot reach the tops of the tall bushes while they can fly and perch and swing and highest fruit is always sweetest, so birds and I may both be satisfied. In the quiet of the long hot afternoons we sit on the wide porch and watch them taking their baths. The bird bath is a shallow basin hollowed out in the rocks and made watertight by a lining of cement. It is surrounded by ferns, primroses, and goldenrod, and is beloved of the birds who come to it despite all the little pools along the shores. They step in and out all day, Fat robins, darting red starts, vireos, chickadees, and sparrows, but at evening they wait for the brown thrasher, who lives in the thicket, to take his dip first. He walks out deliberately and with dignity, enters the pool, splashes to his heart's content, then flies up to the branch of a poplar and sings one short evening song, and not until he has finished his performance 
do the smaller birds venture in. Once in a while a rabbit hops to the edge for a drink, or a vivid green garter snake slips across the pool, or a toad jumps in and sits half submerged, drinking in the moisture through every pore of his fat brown body, and after dark we hear the porcupine shuffling through the bushes around the bath. These porcupines are our nightly enemies. Where they live by day we have never discovered, but they prowl round the camp in the darkness, gnawing and grunting and disturbing our rest. They love salt and grease and old leather, anything left out where they can find it. Needless to say, there is never anything left about, out of place in Patricia's camp, but the end of the porch where the ice cream freezer stands is all gnawed away, the wood being so impregnated with brine as to be an irresistible temptation to any normal porcupine. One winter night, the grandfather of all porks attempted to gnaw down the corner of my sleeping shack, just under the head of my bed. I beat on the wall. He chewed on diligently. I opened the window and threw out an old shoe, hoping that he would take it and go away. He only ambled off a few paces in the bright moonlight and stood looking at me, a huge old fellow, big round as a barrel, with his black quills tipped with white, standing militantly erect. When I lay down again, he shuffled back and shook the wall. In a fury, I seized the little axe and threw it, missing him, of course, but hitting a stone. The porcupine waddled away hastily up the hill and into the bushes. But the little axe has never been of any use since. Patricia often wonders what happened to its edge. I have never confessed that I threw it at a porcupine, for Patricia's tools are sacred. They hang in elaborate order on the main shack walls. Screwdrivers, awls, files, saws, each on its appointed nail, and woe betide the unlucky white, who returns a chisel to the niche consecrated to the auger, for their owner keeps her belongings in place with a scrupulous tidiness that few could hope to rival. She is a carpenter by instinct and inclination, going about with an apron pocket full of nails and a hammer thrust through her belt and it is truly wonderful to see what her small hands and slender wrists can do to bolts and screws. Loose boards and wobbling table legs give her keenest pleasure, and she is forever working at birdhouses, benches, and racks of birch and cedar, all the while discoursing learnedly of cross-cut saws, wrenches, or levels to me, who scarce know the difference between a hammer and an axe. Knowing how she loves to build and mend, I had no scruples about demanding that Patricia help me strengthen George Drapeau's old fishing shack to be the home of the Many Islands Club. We need a meeting place here where we can gather on Sunday afternoons between the midday meal and milking time and talk a bit over the teacups. Casting about for a suitable shelter, I hit upon this little old hut hidden in a cove of mainland and within easy walking distance of all of us. George turned it over to us at once, refusing all thought of any rent, and truly there is little to rent there, but stipulating that no one should go in until he had put away his nets and cleaned up a bit. Those nets hang over the rafters, but I shall never glance at them. The mesh may be a herring mesh, and strictly legal in every respect. They may never have been used to net one pickerel, but I prefer not to examine them, so no fish warden need ever ask me the purpose of those nets. In this kind country, if one is homeless and a house stands empty, one moves in and abides as long as there is need, and this little shack of George Drapeau's has sheltered many a wanderer. The last to inhabit it were the blacks, who lived there, tucked away behind the hemlocks for a season, while Joe Black worked at the mine. Mrs. Black is a city lady, and fond of saying that never in her life did she expect to come down to a house like that. She tells me that, when their boat approached the shore and her four-year-old son, a fat-faced solemn child, caught sight of his new home, he exclaimed, May God protect us, Mama, and hid his face in her lap. But the blacks lived on there, contentedly enough for a year, even entertaining a guest or two in its one small room. A thorough scrubbing, a lining of clean cream-colored paper, and bright pictures cut from magazines have done wonders for the interior of the club but the outside is truly a wreck. Patricia nailed and mended, the doctor whitewashed and braced, but when I saw him astride the ridgepole, tacking on tar paper, 
I shuddered and turned away my eyes, for that sagging roof is backed like a camel, and the doctor is a very heavy man. My only comfort was that he was outside and not inside that wavering pile, and would come down on top and not under it when it fell. The qualifications for joining our club are simple. One must be a native of many islands, or must have spent one winter here, which lets me in. The dues for a woman member are the loan of one cup and saucer and spoon, and for a man the making of one bench or seat. On the door a notice is nailed which reads, The Many Island Club. Everyone welcome. Please see that the fire is out, and hook the door when you leave. I apologized to Patricia for not being able to elect her to full membership, but she assured me promptly and earnestly that she was not at all hurt, that she never cared to belong to clubs, and much preferred to be called a lending member only. I've taken her at her word, borrowing everything we need, from carving knife to cushion covers. Here we meet, drink tea, and talk under the shade of the hemlocks and pines, and our conversations range from fashions to fertilizers, and from care of infants to the care of cows. Once in a while we fall on graver matters, as when lately the Free Methodists held a camp meeting near our lake, and Andy Drapeau left his work to row poor John Bulock seven miles to Le Rapids that he might get religion and make his peace with God. Life is not easy here. We have little time and even less inclination for discussions of matters ethical or religious. Many of us have never heard of a catechism, and if one should ask, what is the chief end of man, I'm afraid the answer would be work and the paying off of mortgages. Few of us can recite our duty to God, but one thing we do know, and that by heart, our duty to our neighbor. When I see in almost every home an orphan being clothed and fed, or hear, as I so often do, that a busy man has left his own scarce finished fields and gone with his team to help some hard-pressed farmer harvest a scant crop, or when I meet a tired woman hurrying across the meadows after her hard day's work, to sit all night beside the bed of a sick neighbor. I know that, though we are not glib at definition, God is truly glorified here at many islands. Plaintiff lowing from the pastures tells me that milking time has come. The others hurry away, leaving me to wash the cups and plates, and rest a while before I row home to the island. The sun drops behind the hill, the sky glows golden, pink, and tenderest green. Tree swallows and Nighthawks dart and swoop over the water, their reflections so sharp and clear that the boat seems hanging in the center of a swirl of circling wings. The tree swallows have a home in the top of a dead poplar on the extreme end of Patricia's island. The parent birds fly in and out of the small round opening fifty times an hour, feeding the young, and the nestlings climb up to the hole and peer out, turning their little shining heads from side to side. The female waits inside at the door of the nest, watching till her mate has wheeled to return. Then she darts out. They meet and pass in the air, at the entrance, and all is done so quickly that one cannot see the exchange. How beautiful they are, with their steel-blue backs and white breasts, and how graceful on the wing! At evening they fly low, thirty or forty feet only above the water, but in the morning they mount high in the blue, with wide-sweeping flight or if on graceful wing, cleaving the sky, sun, moon, and stars forgot, upward I fly. Did Sarah Adams know the tree swallow when she wrote those lines, or was she thinking of the English lark? I do not know, but whenever I sing the words that express so perfectly the eager mood of the soul, straining upward to God, I see our little tree swallows in their morning flight, starting out from their high home, and mounting up, up between the blue lake and the blue sky, and my thought rushes upward with them, far away beyond the sun. End of chapter 10。Chapter 11 of Isles of Eden by Laura Lee Davidson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 11, July 25th. The evening primroses are blooming now, tall and lovely on their slender stems. By day they look pale and faded, 
but at twilight they begin to open their yellow flowers and the air is sweet with perfume sent forth to attack the pink moths their evening visitors the flowers last only one short night by morning they are wilted to compensate for the bird's silence in the woods all the poplar trees are talking their long slender sideways hung stems allow the leaves to dance and rustle in the lightest breeze poplars are a restless folk ours the aspens are particularly so sometimes the ashen bark and dark markings on the stems of young poplars imitate the birches so closely that at a short distance and notwithstanding the difference in their green i am puzzled to distinguish between the two trees but if the day be still a second glance sets me right for the birch leaves are still on their short stiff petioles while the faintest breath of air sets the leaves of the poplars dancing and the whole tree flutters and trembles they are pretty are poplars slender and graceful but the wood is useless except for pulp and they are short-lived falling in the winter gales and always breaking down some more valuable tree when they fall the bark of the younger ones is usually a smooth coppery green wrinkled like the wrist of a kid glove the old trunks are seamed and scaly like an elephant's tough hide the leaves turn bright yellow in the early fall making our woods beautiful but we shall not have the poplars much longer they are giving way surely and rapidly before the springing cedars pines and hemlocks the poplar in dying has its revenge on the near standing tree that is supplanting it for it dies first at the top and breaks off a bushy crown with curved tough branches that turns over and falling and bears down the young tree at its side the long arms like tentacles catch and interlace in the younger tree choking and throttling it until unless released it also dies and poplar and sapling go down together apparently these are fishes as well as birds holidays for not even the rock bass are biting now is the time to try the dusk fishing that sportsmen tell us is so fine we do not find it so but care little anchored off blake's point we sit and patricia fishes and fishes away while i dream bass and dore refuse to bite evening shadows lengthen and soon we give it up and turn away across the bay stopping at blake's for the milk and there receiving the gift of a mess of catfish lest we go fishless for the bullhead is the standby here when all else fails this is their spawning time and black masses of inch-long wigglers are swimming in the shallows along the shores these swarms of tiny catfish are always herded along by one parent or both who swim to and fro between the fry and deep water to keep them safe from marauding bass or pike the bullhead or horned pout is a hideous creature like a gargoyle or a bad dream with its huge head long stiff whiskers thorny spine and black leathery skin and the little ones are ridiculous imitations of their ugly parents there is no close season for the catfish it may be caught at any time anywhere and on any bait in early spring, when the ice has scarce gone out of the lakes, he comes up on the hooks, and in the heat of midsummer he lurks in the mud of an almost dry bottom. He never gives up, and long after he had been denuded of his thick hide, he goes on flopping horribly. His flesh is fairly good, but as for me, I am willing to live on eggs and bacon forever if I must clean and cook the catfish. It is wise, however, to accept all gifts, for if one refuses something offered today, it may never be offered again so we take the bullheads with enthusiasm and i drop them overboard as soon as we are safely out of sight of the house and we go home happily to beans henry and mary blake live on the Oli island in the lake large enough for a farm and are the very pattern of good neighbors mary supplies us with bread milk and butter henry takes care of the boats during the winters and looks after the camps all the year they came to many islands twelve years ago when henry had broken down at his trade of house painter and was pronounced tubercular mary canadian born brought him home perhaps to die they bought their farm and began their fight for health and a home together now the mortgage is paid the farm well stocked henry has shoulders like an ox legs like the trunks of trees and his kind ruddy face warms one like the sight of a fire on a frosty day 
Besides being farmer, house builder, boat builder, and general handyman, he is an artist, painting pictures for his own delight. A huge copy of the horse fair and one of the return from the fair covered two walls of the Blake's parlor. They are remarkable in color and action, truly wonderful when one remembers that they were painted by a man who has had no instruction. Two medals with blue ribbons attached hang from the enormous gilded frames. The proudest moment of my life, says Henry, with a shake in his voice, was when those medals were handed me for the best exhibit of art at the county fair at Watertown. The four walls of the small dining room are also covered with large paintings. The lake, as seen from the window, an autumn landscape, Mary among her sheep, and now Henry is at work on a great map that is to cover the rear wall of the house, and that will show every lake, every stream, every farm and small town from the great Rideau to the river Eau Claire, and from Queensport to Perth. There, spread forth in tints of softest blue and green, we can trace away from our lake of many islands on through the lakes and portage of this lovely country. There are Sand Lake and Bear, Loon Lake and Crow, Deep Lake and Clear, the Pot Spoon and the Big Canoe, with every hill and marsh and strip of woods faithfully portrayed. I hear a good deal from some of my friends in cities about the limitations in their lives. One is debarred from travel, another must earn a living, and so can find no time to create anything. Another has a family that prevents her leading her own life, whatever that may mean. Then I think of Henry Blake, striding his fields with the step of a conqueror, guiding the plough with those great hands that yet can wield such small fine brushes. I see him stop and gaze across the blue lakes to the forests, red and golden in the autumn light, and hear him say, all seasons are beautiful here, but the fall is my time. I like to watch the colors of the trees. They give me ideas for my pictures. End of chapter 11、Eden, Chapter 12 July 28th. Mrs. Drapeau, Rose Bulak's old mother, lives on a long peninsula that stretches off into the lake, shutting in a narrow bay behind it. Sloping meadows, fields of corn, big barns, and a line of woodland lie between this island and the sunsets. The house, a two room log affair, has no flower garden. The potatoes grow up to the doorstone, but there is a field of buckwheat in bloom. Spreading snowy white to the shore, and over it yellow butterflies dance and skip. All the fence corners are tangles of feathery purple pink milkweed over which big monarch butterflies wave their red brown velvet wings. It is hard to believe that these beautiful, fragile creatures feeding among flowers can be hardy travelers, but they are. Like the birds, they migrate, coming up from the south in the spring to their northern limit in Canada. And turning southward again when the milkweed bloom is over. Great swarms of them are blown like flower petals along the wind in autumn to fall and die in the lakes, so unconcerned is nature with the fate of her children. In every community there are certain houses famed for hospitality, certain women known as good hostesses. Such a house is this of the Drapeaux, such a hostess is its mistress. I have never entered her doorway without finding two or three strangers lounging by the stove, never passed the house at mealtime without seeing at least one hungry man eating at her table. On Sundays are visiting days here. The guests spill out of the small room and sit on the embankment of earth against the house wall or on logs brought from the woodpile. It is no uncommon thing to find two or sometimes three relays of people enjoying Mrs. Trapeau's good food. In winter, every storm bound traveler knows that at Drapeau's he will get food, warmth, and a welcome. Don't you get very tired of cooking and washing dishes for so many? I asked. She answers, No, I am used to it. Twas like this since ever I could remember. When Drapeau was alive and the boys was all to home, it was nothing uncommon for me to cook for fifteen and twenty on a Sunday. Mrs. Drapeau came to many islands in the first days of its settlement. 
I mind the time, she tells me, when there was never a stove in all this country. The people cooked at the old stone fireplaces and baked their bread in great iron pots buried in the embers. There was never such good bread as come out of those iron pots. I think I can smell it yet. There was no matches in them days, neither. Not a match was ever known. Every man carried a flint stone and an iron ring, and to make a light he would strike the ring on the flint and let the spark fall on a bit of spunk and twas so they lighted the fires she rejoices in a huge stove of latest design and florid decoration ordered by catalogue from toronto it has many complexities of draughts and dampers a tank for hot water and even a dial on the oven door to tell the degree of heat within mrs trapeau takes great pride in that dial although she does not depend on it the back of her hand being the familiar guide with her frail bent body, gnarled hands, and patient old face, she stands to me for the brave pioneer woman of every land, and it tires me even to think of all the work she has done in her seventy-odd years of ceaseless toil, all the carding, spinning, weaving, and sewing, the washing, cooking, milking, and churning, the weeding, planting, and hoeing. No wonder she is thin and bent. The big hardy countrywoman is a myth in this hard clime. Most of the women I have seen here are small and broken at middle life. Of the five sons she reared with so much labor, two are dead, one married, one a wanderer, and one only is left at home to work the farm. He is a prosperous man, as prosperity goes here, and we have long hoped that he would take time to build for his mother the new house for which she longs. For ever since the boys were growed, Mrs. Strapeau has had a vision and a great desire. It is for a good house of boards, with plastered walls, an upstairs and a downstairs, a parlor and bedrooms. In her mind she has furnished and refurnished this dream house to her liking, and has hung on its gay walls the crayon portraits of her father and mother, and the faded old photograph of Rockcliffe Village, the place her parents left when they came out to Canada so many years ago. Although she has never walked the length of that pictured street, nor entered the doors of the little church at its end, Rockcliffe Village is home to Mrs. Drapeau. Her father and mother left England in a sailing vessel, and it took them seven weeks to make the voyage. They settled in Queensport, eighteen miles away. Those was terrible days, says Mrs. Drapeau. I mind my mother telling of the famine year, just after the Russian War. That would be in fifty-seven. When flour went up to twenty dollars a barrel, and Indian meal to seventeen, and even if the people could have paid, they could not get it, for there was none to be bought. They was facing starvation. At last, old Tim Bogart went to Andrew Cameron and offered for to go in with him, they two being the rich men of the settlement, to buy in two hundred barrels of flour for the relief of the settlers. I'll not risk my money, says Andrew, who was a very miserable man. We'd never get it back, he says. We would too, says Tim, and I'll take the chance. So he mortgaged his farm and bought the flour, bringing it in with oxen all the way from Kingston, and he appointed Sam, the miller, to give it out to the people. Sam sold it at cost, so long as it lasted, and when a man could not pay, Sam took his note and gave him the flour. When the famine was over and the settlement well started again, Every man came and paid what he owed, and Tim Bogart lost never a cent. I was a very small child then, but I remember hearing the talk. In spite of hard work and advancing years, Mrs. Drapeau is active still. I rode over yesterday to buy some eggs, and hearing a great commotion in the pasture, wandered on to see what was going forward. She was helping the men to round up a cow and her calf, preparatory to selling them to Alf Henderson, who was waiting to swim them over to mainland. Everyone was running round and round the field. Men were shouting, cow lowing, calf bellowing, the bull roaring and threatening to break down the paling round his enclosure. When Mrs. Strapeau caught sight of me, she laid her hands on the top rail of the fence, and with the ease of a lad she vaulted over. If she had been a witch sailing toward me on her broomstick, I could not have been more dumbfounded. When the cow was fondly caught, we followed her and her captors down the hill to the shore to watch them away. The men climbed into a leaky old punt, laid the calf in at their feet, and pushed off. 
After a moment's frantic bellowing, the cow, poor creature, waded out after them, and away, across the narrow bay they all went, old Bess swimming desperately, and soon all we could see of her was the tips of her horns and the whites of her terrified eyes. As we climbed the steep hill to the house, I looked at Mrs. Strapeau. She was not even breathing fast. After a prolonged discussion of one thing and another, I returned to the island and Patricia, having forgotten all about the eggs for which I had been sent. "'You grow more like the natives every day,' she said despondently. "'I'll never consent to your spending another winter among them.' "'Natives? What do you mean?' I retorted. "'There are no natives here. Everyone is merely staying on for a while. But all expect to go back to the old country sooner or later.' They are merely sojourners, as William Forette calls them. Permanent residents, or transient. I shall never understand them, sighs Patricia. I suppose I ask too much, but I do wish that one of them would once give me a definite yes or no to a plain question. I asked Forette, did Jeanie bring me the mixing bowl from town? And his answer is, well, if she had, she'd have sent it over. I hear Mary Blake ask Jimmy Todd, have you done the milking? The red cow gives some, but not much, is his reply. When I ask Henry Blake if he thinks it looks like rain, he answers, Well, we've had an awful long dry spell. No, I shall never understand them. It took me five minutes yesterday to get at what Sally Mae Bulock wanted when she said Mrs. Owen sent me over to ask for the lend of the rainproofs. She's going to town today. There was nothing difficult about that, I said. She thought it looked like rain, and she wanted to borrow the Macintoshes and the rubber hats. I understood her perfectly. Which only goes to prove my first assertion that you are half a native yourself, retorted Patricia. End of chapter 12、Chapter、13 from the Isles of Eden by Laura Lee Davidson This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 13 August 1st. By the end of July, the warblers begin to congregate on the islands. Till midsummer, they are scattered in pairs throughout the mainland woods, preoccupied with bringing up their families. But now the young are safely out of the nests and able to take care of themselves, so the old birds go off on a joyous holiday before beginning their long journey to the south. They gather in mixed flocks, the fruit eaters feasting on the purple shad berries and the few wild cherries left, the insect eaters pursuing worms and flies. But they hop silently from twig to twig. There is no singing. A large company arrived this morning and we counted them pine, Canadian, black throated, green, black burnian, and yellow warblers, while round the edges of the crowd skirmished our familiar red starts, vireos, downy woodpeckers, goldfinches, orioles, chickadees, and song sparrows. The woods were alive with small birds. Patricia has gone wild. I lay her field glasses on the table beside the cups and plates, and in the midst of a sentence, with a forkful of fish on its way to her lips, she starts up and stares into the woods, and presently she is off after some beckoning wing, and I am left to finish the meal alone. The days are hot and still. The lake is like glass, and only the rock bass are biting. The rock bass, or red eye, is the fisherman's nuisance, a pariah among fish. Nobody wants him, nobody likes him, and to say of a tenderfoot, he even eats rock bass, is the last expression of scorn. The fish is small and thin, with goggling eyes, and large fins armed with spines that stick into the hand, making festering sores. He is hard to skin, his flesh tastes like mud, and to crown all, he is the easiest fish in the world to catch and the hardest to get off the hook. After a hot morning spent in pulling in rock bass, clubbing them on the head, and throwing them away, all the gentler traits of the sportsman are extinct. He is ready to fight his best friend on any or no provocation. We passed the doctor on the lake today, and he had caught so many rock bass that he pretended not to see us. The deer flies, too, are at their best, and their bite adds to the joy of fishing. The deer fly looks like a large house fly with a broad black band across transparent wings. 
it goes into the flesh with two sword-like nippers that come out bringing a piece of the victim with them they leave not a bite but a wound you feel the stab kill the fly and hope that this time the place will not swell when it begins to itch you apply ammonia dilute carbolic acid anything your fancy suggests and go to bed in comparative peace once under the cover the poison begins its work and before you can throw off the blanket you are scratching and tearing at a red-hot welt that threatens to rob you of all self-control the breathless heat of the july afternoon was chosen by our neighbor mrs mccully from the mica mine as an appropriate time for visiting she never comes empty-handed but when she feels the urge to seek society she brings an offering along as an excuse for a call this time she came armed with a giant stalk of buckwheat in bloom i accepted it complimented its growth and beauty and planted it carefully in a crack between the rocks where it immediately began to wither away then i settled myself to hear the news of the county nora mccully and her husband are caretakers at the mine that lies back of the drapeau's farm on the mainland jim is boss of the gang when the mine is working and nora runs the miners boarding-house no sinecure when there is a full force of twenty or twenty-five men unlike our black coal pits a mica mine is clean this one a place of beauty i love to stand beside the old pump-house at the very crest of the hill and look out on the wide panorama of woods and water that stretches away north east and west the pits are holes in the rocky slope some forty some a hundred and fifty feet deep with pools of clear water at the bottom that never freezes and is never warmed crazy twisting ladders cling to the sides and lead down into the depths of the earth from these pits the mica trail leads downhill to the shore where the ore is loaded on the big mine scow and ferried across to Bulak's landing whence it goes by wagon to loon lake station and by train to kingston red sumac and yellow goldenrod fringe the edges of the pits ferns grow in the crannies of the rocks all the way down to the green pools piles of shining mica glisten in the sunlight and on the hillside the cedars stand clad in wide-spreading green velvet skirts like ladies waiting on a staircase just now there is an oversupply of mica on the market the mine is not working and nora and jim to whom she alludes in a stylish manner as my husband mr mccully reign there alone the long barracks with the bunks at the halls and the cookhouse with the long table are silent and empty nora of the sharp tongue and the ready irish wit of the heavy footfall and the eyes so crossed that i never know where she is looking nora formidable in anger but with a heart of gold it is she who nurses us when we fall ill who can watch night after night without sleep or rest and who is dr le baron's right hand in an emergency it is nora who lays the newborn babies in their mother's arms hers are the hands that dress our tired bodies for their long sleep this afternoon when mrs mccully had seated herself and was fairly started on the description of the big bealing that had broken out on jim's neck i looked round for patricia as usual she had disappeared patricia treats the natives with an anxious politeness when she meets them but she cannot be said to revel in their society nor to enjoy their conversation in their turn they speak of her as a real fine woman and are always ready to sell her something but there the intercourse usually stops when they have news to impart they bring it to me who having wintered as well as summered here seem more like a many islander to them the ways of campers are past finding out and to nora mccully especially the camps are fertile fields for investigation campers is queer you know that yourself she observed to-day now that new one on henderson's point she do beat all for style she brought a frenchwoman down from montreal to talk to her and a trained nurse from the hospital to take care of the baby and them two women looks like they was lost they know no more about the country than a frog does about a holiday i rode over there to take home the wash and they was settin at the table eating but not so much as a cup of tea did they offer me i rode all the way round the point and i was all give out and fair starved but the woman never so much as said have you a mouth on you so i had to stop in at little jack's on the way home to get me a bite 
I guess it's not the style to give folks something to eat where she come from. The baby is two years old, they told me, and it hasn't never walked. They had it in a basket hanging to a tree, and the nurse was sitting right beside it all the time. I heard the woman ask her, did she want to take a little walk, but she says no. No, madame, she says, I'll just sit here by the child. One of them big water birds, not a loon, ma'am, but a big blackbird, a nighthawk, I think it was, flew a past just now, and you can't never tell. It might flap its wings in the child's face. Be you going to keep that child in a basket all his life, I ask. Why don't you put him down on the ground and leave him try to crawl? We did that too, says the mother, but we found him eating sand. Sure, if he did, it wouldn't hurt him, I says. All the young ones round here eat sand. It's good for them. They needs it, like the young ducks. Then I asked her, could I take him? And she says, just for a minute. And the poor thing just looked up in my face and laid his head against me like he was tired out. Well, mothers is the same the world over, for the woman followed me to the shore and her eyes full of tears. Oh, Mrs. McCulley, she says, I've lost two other children, and I'm afraid this baby's going too. Do you think he looks very ill? The doctor will come from Montreal every other week to see him, but what will I do if he gets ill suddenly? What do you want with a doctor from Montreal, I says, when you got the doctor of the world right here? You get Jason Henderson to hitch up and take you and the child to Queensport to Dr. LeBaron. He's the finest in the Dominion for babies, and only eighteen miles away. She said she would, but I don't suppose that nurse will let her. You know what the children round many islands look like. There's nothing ever kills them, that is, if they don't get drowned. At last we had reached the reason of her visit. She had come to tell me that Charlie McDade's eldest child had been drowned in Canoe Lake the day before, and to invite me to the funeral. It all happened in a half hour, she told me. The children had gone to the old bridge to fish, as they had done hundreds of time, and the boy must have leaned too hard on the rotted rail, for it broke and he went over the side. God rest his soul. The water isn't deep there, only about two feet, so he must have struck his head, for he never stood up. There he lay, plain to see, and the mother was the first to find him. I seen Margaret McDade today. She's near crazy. And she with no man to turn to, as you might say, for her fool of a Charlie is all over the township after that good-for-nothing Sessie Bulek. Oh, Mrs. McCulley, don't speak about the girl so. How would you like someone to talk in that way about your child? There'll never be the occasion for anyone to speak like that about any girl of mine. I'll see to that, says Nora darkly. She and Jim are two of the ugliest people ever seen, and they have a small daughter with hair like thistledown, eyes blue as the lake, and a face like a flower. Sure, I don't know where that mother gets her looks, says her mother. She don't take them from Jim or me. She must get them off the wind. God love her. End of chapter 13Chapter 14 of Isles of Eden by Laura Lee Davidson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 14, August 4th. Though this is only the first week in August, there is the premonition of fall everywhere. The berries are ripe on every bush. The seed balls of the wild sarsaparilla are shining black. The viburnums are a pinkish red, and already the bittersweet is turning yellow. The child's funeral was to be early in the afternoon. It was useless to begin any work, so I sat on a log jutting out over the water and waited for the time to pass. Every old stump along the water's edge held a miniature garden, a bit of fern, a few blades of grass, a flowering herb or two, and some moss. Big crawfish walked to and fro across the sand. Minnows flashed silver in the sunshine. Hundreds of clamshells lay on the bottom pearl side up, and small fishes floated idly, opalescent in the light, olive green, yellow, blue, and orange, with bright scarlet spots in the gill covers. They look like brilliant bits of enamel, yet they are only the common little pumpkin seed or sunfish, the boy's first fish, for which he angles busily with string and pin. Found in every clear pond and stream, they swim for the little angler, and who can guess what dreams of freedom? what joy and adventure they bring to the youngster, 
trudging along the lanes of evening, swinging his tiny catch. The sundial shadow lay on the mark of noon. The farm horses, Sandra Poe Shore, were walking uphill to the house to be harnessed for the afternoon's work in the field. It was time to start. I rode across the lake and landed on the muddy shore, where wide patches of arrowhead stood in the water, lifting their white flowers high out of the swamp. A muskrat swam swiftly across, propelling himself with strong strokes of his flat, hairless, sideways hung tail. He headed straight for the high bank and dived into his burrow, quite unconcerned about my presence, knowing, I suppose, that this is not the time for traps or guns, and that he need not be afraid for his summer skin. Mushrats, as we call them here, are a staple source of income to the trappers. When I see a coat of French seal in a shop window, I see also William Forette, or Black Jack Bulock, tramping through the snow to the traps, where the rats with the soft brown fur are waiting to bring them sometimes as much as two dollars for the raw pelt. I climbed the hill, crept under the rail fence, and found the trail that goes through the woods to the old graveyard by the roadside. On either side of the path, the pearly everlasting stood so thick among the ferns that the woods looked as though a light snow had fallen. I gathered a handful of the white rosettes that always make me think of old seed-pearl brooches. Their spicy, weedy odor had already the tang of autumn. A black-and-white warbler climbed quickly up the stem of a birch, stopped on a limb, and peeped at me, with his little striped head twisted over his shoulder. He matched the birch bark exactly. See, 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 he piped in thin, wiry tones. A beautiful black squirrel sat motionless on a fence corner, his sable plume erect. For him, as for the muskrat, there was safety from the guns, for the season for hunting him does not begin until the 15th of November. Along the road in the warm, hay-scented afternoon, the neighbors were gathering, women pushing babies in go-carts, men hurrying along in their shirt-sleeves, little boys romping and wrestling or sliding down the dry grass on the slippery slopes. The old neglected mounds were overgrown with dusty weeds. The small new grave looked like a red gash in the clay. Near the fence and quite alone I saw Cecily Bulak and wondered at her being there. Was she so stupid as not to know what the neighbors were saying about her? Was it curiosity that had brought her? or a determination to assert her right to be one of us at a meeting like this. Probably none of all this was in her childish mind, and she had come because everyone else was coming. No one spoke to her, no one stood near her, but presently I saw Mrs. Swanson, that good woman, edging round the circle until she stood at the girl's side, and once she laid her kind hand on Cecily's arm. A cloud of dust far down the road announced the funeral procession, and we stopped our discussion of crops and fashions, and waited in silence as it drew near. The rector's buggy came first. He alighted, removed his dust-covered linen coat, shook it and hung it on the fence, then took his place at the head of the grave. A spring wagon came next bringing the small coffin and four half-grown boys, all wearing new straw hats with black streamers and black bands on their sleeves. Then came the buggy with the father and mother, then a long line of vehicles behind. Never did the words of the burial service sound so beautiful. In the profound quiet of the hot afternoon, the rector's voice came to me as from very far away. The smell of the cedars and the sun, the still airless heat, the glare of sunlight on the water all stupefied me, and I heard him in a dream. Suddenly I waked. The rector had finished the service, had looked away from his book, and was speaking to our hearts. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, he said. The sun shall not light on them, nor any heat, for the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. A ripple of interest stirred the dull faces, like the passing of a light wind over still waters. The wandering eyes steadied to attention. Here was something we could understand. Every father, every mother, within sound of those words, knew what it meant to spend strength, nay, life itself, in giving food to a household. How many times did those children beg for water in the hot nights? 
A time was coming when they and we would hunger and thirst no more. I looked across the narrow grave and into the vacant eyes of poor Joel Peacemaker, the imbecile, and thought of the day when the fierce Canadian sun struck him down in the hayfield, and when Dr. LeBaron brought him up from the very dust of death to walk among us forevermore a child. Yes, we know about hunger and thirst and the smiting force of the sun, and, oh, how well we know tears. I was roused from my reverie by the clatter of falling stones. William Forrett was filling the grave, the other men taking turns after him and shoveling the earth. Someone stooped and lifting a pitiful little dusty cross of wheat ears and life everlasting from the coffin, handed it to his mother. The father's weak, handsome face was swollen with tears, his features convulsed in his effort to keep them back, but the mother's face was calm. She was looking away across the lake, her eyes lifted to the hills. A goldfinch swinging on a thistle flung forth a gay little song. Across the fields came the jangle of distant cowbells. We talked quietly while the men worked on. It was over. We shook hands with a father and mother, saying something intended as condolence and waited while they prepared to drive away. All the while I noticed that Charlie did not once glance at Cecily. When he lifted his wife into their buggy, I saw that he kept his arm around her, and that she leaned her face against his shoulder as they drove off. Soon they all clattered away down the road in a cloud of dust, and we walked home to the milking, leaving the little new grave lying bare and raw in the dry grass. End of chapter 14《Chapter Fifteen of Isles of Eden by Laura Lee Davidson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Fifteen, August Ninth. Queensport was to have a lawn fete. The notice, printed in coloured chalks, being posted at the store at Fallen Timber, reading thus: "Social for the benefit of the Canadian Red Cross, to be held on the schoolhouse lawn." Admission and supper, 25 cents. Ice cream, cakes, and candy for sale. God save the king. That stately and patriotic ending struck me with awe. Unaccustomed as I am to living under a king, I do not remember hearing anyone express that much interest in the President of the United States, except when we pray in the churches for whoever happens to be living in the White House at the time including in our petitions, Congress, governors of states, and all others in authority. A lawn fete that God saves the king seemed so important that I determined to attend, to see whether it differed from plain fairs and church sales under a republican form of government. I went. The social did not differ from like entertainments I have attended elsewhere. There was music, there were speeches, there were strings of Japanese lanterns festooning the fences. There were long tables loaded with food and scores of flushed, tired women serving coffee, selling cakes, digging ice cream out of freezers in the time-honored way. And ah me, there was Cecily Bulock wearing a thin pink blouse, near silk stockings, and high-heeled papery shoes parading defiantly with Charlie. They did not stay long, but presently clattered away in Charlie's old trap behind his fast little mare that he lashed into a gallop on the hard road. A trip to Queensport is an adventure for me, because I live on an island and must depend on wind and weather and one neighbor and another to help me on my way. And so I never can know with any certainty when I shall arrive in town or return to the camp again. I must row two miles and a half to Henderson's Landing, and walk a half a mile in to the first farm on the way. Thence I ride four miles to Sark on the milk wagon that is going to the cheese factory, and at Sark the stage picks me up and takes me to town along with the mailbags. The road is winding and hilly, passing through groves of cedars and pines, skirting marshes full of arrowhead and reeds and along little streams bordered by vivid cardinal flowers, where great green dragonflies whir over the sunken logs. It follows the shores of lakes, where white water lilies lie at anchor, 
goes on past orchards and fields and under tall elms until the roofs and spires of the town appear on the horizon on it goes past the old indian carrying place that lies between wolf lake and sand and on to their resting place by the locks for the mississauga indians had a great encampment here at many islands and used to travel down through a long chain of lakes and portages to queensport and the rideau thence they went along the river to ottawa to get their allowance of guns ammunition blankets and provisions from the government they took their time about these journeys hunting and fishing all the way to ottawa and back the old name for queensport was head of the lake not changed until eighteen forty six its first postmaster aaron chambers was appointed in eighteen forty two it is a deer town with shaded streets along which little boys drive the cows to the pastures in the mornings and back again at night and where in the winter the children go whizzing down on sleds on a slide that begins at betsy's corner at one end of town and stops at the red mill at the other end there are five churches two hotels and many gardens i never saw such flowers as wave and flame and beckon from every dooryard the little hotel is a picture long and low with walls of streaked and faded pink stucco and with the gate of the old wagon yard at the side there is a narrow gallery along the upper story with a railing of criss-cross latticework white and green and a long row of flower boxes on its top they hold a glory of geraniums fuchsias marigolds and patience plants with long vines dropping over the side that almost touch the heads of passers underneath if canada's summer is short it is beautiful with a loveliness that goes to the heart queensport dips her feet in the little rideau and curving from the town dock the shores form a horseshoe sloping away to the south in meadows and pastures and rising at the north in a higher ridge last spur of the laurentian range over the lake the herring gulls wheel and dip giving their shrill peevish cries or an eagle soars away across the sky my friends the finbars whom i visit live in a big brick house set back from the main street and shaded with tall elms and maples at the side there is a lawn and at the rear a garden that slopes to the water's edge john finbar irish gentleman founder of the house came to canada from the university college of cork in 1836 when he was 18 years old he came in a sailing vessel and it took him three months to make the voyage this part of ontario was then a great lumber country vast quantities of oak elm ash maple and pine were cut on the mountain made into rafts towed on the canal to kingston and thence floated down the st lawrence to quebec thousands of barrel stays were cut here and shipped to the west indies to be made into puncheons for sugar and molasses potash was manufactured in great quantities and sent to montreal and thousands of pounds of sugar were taken from the groves of maple that covered the hills a rich country and a growing one a land of opportunity for a young man an uncle john vincent finbar priest and missionary was already here had built a small log church and was traveling the country on horseback and foot preaching teaching and building up a parish so his nephew young john was not alone in a strange land but had a kinsman at hand of influence and authority to give counsel and help in case of need after a few years of travel in canada and the states the young man settled at head of the lakes and established a general store or trading post with settlers immigrants and indians for his customers in 1850 he married and brought his wife a girl of 19 to the old stone house by the bridge and the law of that home was hospitality it was the stopping place for every traveler no one was ever turned away from that door wandering settlers visiting celebrities traveling clergy or nuns immigrants indians the poor the well-to-do all found lodging and a welcome and none ever left that house without a gift it was more than the necessary charity of a new country where inns are few and villages separated by great distances where the traveller must be given shelter and a meal lest he lie cold or go hungry it was an open-hearted hospitality and the tradition of it lives now in the brick house to the town 
to which the family moved in 1877, where there are always visitors and from which none ever goes away empty-handed. I love to hear her daughters tell of that young wife from the city, traveling long miles by stage to her home in the tiny settlement between the forest and the lake, and how she faced the problems of her new life with such fine courage. I'm told that she was afraid neither of Indians nor of white men, and that she was always respected. Did her brave heart ever falter, I wonder, when her husband had to leave her alone with her children, and with the Indian encampment only six miles away? If it did, I'm sure no one knew it. I love, too, to hear of her first Christmas in the old house, when John Finbar walked sixteen miles to church. There were few horses in the country then. Everyone traveled in ox sleds or walked, and the young mother stayed at home with her twin babies, and of how, when he came in cold and weary, she had a fine Christmas dinner waiting, after which they opened a great Christmas box from the city that was filled with all sorts of good things, and held, best of all, books, their unfailing resource and joy. A few days later the husband had to go away again, leaving Janet Finbar alone with her babies and a little nursemaid. The mother sat before the fire in the big stone fireplace, her foot on the rocker of the cradle, her eyes on her book. A shadow crossed the uncurtained window. She glanced up to see two strange men looking in at her. Go, Kitty, she said. See what those men want to bring them in to the fire. Kitty went, and I have always thought that the little maid showed courage, too. The men came in, shaggy and wild. Are you strangers? Do you need anything? Mrs. Finbar inquired. They were immigrants, lately landed, they told her, and were living far back on the mountain. They had wished to make their confession and attend Mass, and had set off in search of a priest. But after walking fifteen miles through the snow, they had found the log church closed, and so had walked on to Queensport, seven miles farther, and were frozen and exhausted. Mrs. Finbar made the wanderers come to the fire, and she and Kitty bestirred themselves to set forth a good dinner, the best of the Christmas goose, the half the Christmas pudding. After the men had eaten enormously and were rested and ready to start on their homeward tramp, their hostess made a parcel of food for them to eat on the way. As they were leaving, one stepped to the cradle and looked long at the sleeping twins. Then, leaning over them, he blessed them. "'May you and yours never know hunger or want,' he said to the mother, and then with farewells they were gone, and Mrs. Finbar never heard of them again. But the immigrant's blessing lingered with the household. Sorrow it knew, and illness, and anxiety, but never want. There has always been prosperity and comfort there, and plenty to give away. The sons of the house went forth to fill positions of importance in the dominion. One is a canon of a cathedral, one a physician, one a lawyer with the mouth-filling title, chief clerk of the crown in chancellery, and one is a merchant, carrying on his father's business. Of the five daughters, one is a nun, and four live at home in the brick house, dispensing their mother's charity. The last years of Janet Finbar's life were spent in an invalid's chair, from which she ordered the ways of her household. Since she was unable to go abroad, her neighbors all came to her, and the life of the town and the whole countryside flowed through the big house, with a garden sloping to the blue water. The older woman here tell me how lovely she was as a young woman, and of how beautifully she dressed in handsome clothes from the city, and I never forgot to add that she wore them only a very short time, then made some excuse to give them away to her less fortunate neighbors. What pleasure those pretty dresses must have given to the women cut off from all but life's barest necessities, how they must have enjoyed the richness of those silks and fine cloths from town. A great woman shaping her life to fine issues, a keen judge of character, rarely deceived, as at home with the premier of Canada as with the wife of the poorest immigrant, taking a vital interest in the politics and problems of her country. I wish I could have known her, that I, too, could have sat beside her chair and heard her wise comment on the life of her day, a life wider, fuller, and with more of dignity, I dare to think, than the lives of most of us. End of chapter 15
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 16 August 12th As a matter of course, John Finbar, third, volunteered for service at Canada's first call, and had barely grazed eighteen, the Canadian age limit, when he was accepted and sent overseas with the Canadian Engineers Signal Company. He is here at Queensport on a holiday, and for the first time I have met a returned soldier willing to talk about the war. Usually they have been silent when I ventured a question. They were anxious to forget. But perhaps because he is younger than most, or because temporarily he needs the relief of speech, John Finbar seems to wish to tell of his life overseas. He sailed from Quebec in 1917, and from the terrific storm into which the transport ran at once, until the signing of the armistice, this boy passed through horrors that no homekeeping imagination could ever picture. As a signalman, he was always far ahead of the lines in every offensive. Hill 70, Amiens, Arras, Canal du Nord, Cambrai, Valenciennes, Pachendal. He did not get to Mons, having been relieved just before the final engagement. But we took quite a number of small towns, he assures me, as if an apology for not being in the big fight. He came home with a decoration and without a wound, but what of the scars on his mind and spirit? These we can never know. I ply him with questions. What were your duties in the Signal Corps? To be responsible for all communications between the battalions and brigade headquarters, to lay the wires and to repair them when broken, our orders being to keep the line in at all cost. What discomfort was hardest to bear? Dirt, cooties, he answers with disgust. What was the worst place you were in? The mud of Pachendal. We worked there in water up to the waist. I dream about that often. He's a steady, fine, upstanding young fellow, built on simple lines and without nerves or fanciful imaginings, but sharp sounds still make him start and duck and tremble, certain odors still turn him faint and sick, and at some kinds of food he cannot bear to look. We sit on the veranda with its flower boxes, its hanging baskets of ferns, its canary in a gilt cage, and watch the hummingbirds poised over the larkspurs in the garden while John smokes and talks at intervals. He describes the sound of the shells coming over and how scared the boys were. It wasn't so bad at first, but every time you went in it grew harder. The trench mortar bombs were the worst, he tells me. Flying pigs, we used to call them. They had two lumps on the sides like wings, and they came through the air turning from side to side. You simply couldn't dodge them they would seem to follow you. There was a fellow in our company, he goes on, who could pick out the men who were going to get hit. Wendy Anderson, we called him, and after a while, gloomy Anderson, because he always had a grouch. Well, he'd say, I believe this one and that fellow over there will get bumped off today. And sure as we're sitting here, two out of the three would go just as he said. He got his, poor chap, but honestly, we could hardly be sorry. He made us so jumpy with his predictions. Lots of fellows used to pretend that they did not believe in God, John goes on confidentially. They'd laugh at religion and make fun of us boys when we were saying our prayers. But I noticed they'd all get to praying when they were scared or hurt. I never would stand for their laughing at me. Don't you talk to me like that, I'd say. I heard you praying last night. And then we'd all give them the laugh. He seems to feel a little rancor against the enemy. I used to tell the fellows they ought not to hate the Germans for fighting. They were doing their duty, the same as we were, he said. With quiet sorrow, he tells of the worst thing he had to stand, the death of his chum, who was brought in all shot to pieces when they were far out in front of the sector, with no surgeon within miles, and out of the terrible night of agony, when the boy kept calling for his mother. We had nothing in the world to give him. The dressing stations were far in the rear, so we could not do much for him, but we gave him what water we had, and we boys took turns holding his hand. He died at sunrise, and we had to leave him there in the mud and go forward, but
but a few days later we found the chaplain and came back and buried him and marked his grave then we all got together and made up a letter to his mother telling her how he did not suffer and had every attention and all that all the lies we could think of to make her feel that everything was all right but i'll never forget that it was the worst of the whole war for me he was my best friend with a lump in my throat and the stinging tears in my eyes i dimly imagined that night of horror and thank god with all my strength that the dying boy did not go through his gethsemane alone but that the other boys were there to take turns holding his hand I thank God also that the soldier at my side had at last the joy of a triumphant return, for he can sit in the quiet garden telling without emotion of the hardships of the life overseas, and can describe in even tones the horror and fear and filth of the trenches. His voice breaks and his eyes grow misty when he tells of the relief of that homecoming. We came in at the old Union Station and had to wait for hours before we were demobbed. I thought I was used to standing around waiting, but this time it was awful. For there were mother and father close to the grating. I could almost touch them, both looking for me. When I got home, there was our house just draped with flags, and at first I could not think what it was all about. I asked if there was going to be a parade, and for a week after it, it was like a big reception, with flowers everywhere and people coming in and the telephone ringing every minute. When I wanted to get off my old uniform and change into civvies, I had to have an entirely new outfit, for I had been away so long that nothing I had would meet on me. John Finbar carries in his pocket an order of the day, issued by Major General A. C. MacDonald, a message for the soldier to live by uprightly, to die by gallantly. It is dated November 17, 1918. One word recurs throughout the word honor. Our glorious record since August of this year is too well known to require itemized comment. Let it suffice to say that we have had the honor of being in the van every time there was heavy work to do. In starting on this final march for German territory, let us do so with a firm resolve to quit ourselves throughout like men, real soldier men, and trust it with the honor of Canada and the good name of the old First Division. Before closing, I ask that every member of this splendid old division that I have had the honor to command give sincere thanks to Almighty God for his protection and the splendid victory vouchsafed to us. Entrust it with the honor of Canada, John Finbar and the thousands of Canadian boys from the farms and the factories, the shops and the universities went forward with steadfast courage to wounds, prison camps, and lonely death and the stories of their victories, of Fest Hubert, of Vimy Ridge, of Hill 70, and the line of the bloody salient of many another fierce fight, tell how nobly they fulfilled that trust. End of chapter 16「Isles of Eden」is in the public domain. Chapter 17. August 15th. In the old days before the Great War, Queensport was an important place. Steamboats, the Rideau King, the Rideau Queen, used to make landings here, stopping twice a week on their way from Kingston to Ottawa. One could sit on the Finbar's porch, and looking away over the beds of pansies, forget-me-nots, clove pinks, and mignonettes, see them loading and unloading at the dock. But since the war our glory has departed, and now only an occasional motorboat stops at the foot of the garden. There is a rest camp for shell-shocked soldiers somewhere on the north shore of the lake, and two or three times a week a motor launch brings convalescents to town for an outing. They sit about talking or smoking in silence. Sometimes they play heartbreakingly childish games. Yesterday they were all catching the painted butterflies and pinning them on their sleeves. Without thinking, I spoke to one of the men. He started, trembling and pawing the ground like a frightened horse, and looked at me with agonized eyes as he strove to answer. I will never make that mistake again. Robert Finbar, head of the house, comes out of the store and goes down the garden path 
laden with chocolate cigarettes chewing gum and a great pitcher of lemonade he does not look toward the men but with god-given tact goes quietly past them and speaks to the nurses then he walks as quietly up the path again without looking back and he does this every time a boat comes in from the hospital no one knows least of all the finbars how many boxes bales and dollars went from this household overseas during the war this general store established by john finbar first so many years ago as the only trading post for the settlement sells everything known to the desire of man i love to linger there where every customer seems a friend and where there is bringing and taking away of gifts as well as purchases mary finbar knows every one who comes and remembers to ask news of every one who has been left at home there are other shops in queensport now but every one stops here and sits a while hearing the news and telling it just now the men are coming in to be outfitted for the western grain fields buying dunnage bags boots straw hats and flannel shirts for the trek to the harvest fields has begun about august the fifteenth after the hay oats and wheat are garnered there the younger men each with bag and gun take tickets for portage la paris brandon or regina from there they scatter by twos and threes for the grain cutting when the threshing begins they work in gangs of ten and twelve the wages are good five or six dollars a day and often more but the day is twelve hours long and longer for when the grain stands ripe and a storm is coming that grain must be harvested and then they work from starlight to starlight and that in this northern land is from four in the morning until nine or ten at night the standard unit for the western farm is the quarter section one hundred and sixty acres the free homestead allotment prosperous farmers usually own at least two quarters and wealthy farmers often five or six in consideration of the very low cost of transportation the harvesters promised to stay the whole season three months to my great satisfaction charlie mcdade comes in to-day swaggering about the store buying his outfit for it seems he is going to the west too though where the habitually impecunious charlie found ready money for his ticket no one can imagine at any rate he is going and every one rejoices three months away from many islands in sicily is not as long as one could wish but it may suffice to turn his fancy or hers one can only hope indian jake also came in to-day saluting us gravely he lives in a house on the lake shore loaned him by robert finbar the old man wandered into town late last fall with his squaw and four young children and stopped at the store for food winter was coming on the travellers had nowhere to go so they were established forthwith on a piece of land belonging to the finbars ostensibly to care for the home and the fruit trees thereon the family settled itself comfortably according to indian ideas of comfort which seemed to mean cooking eating and sleeping out of doors and going into the house when company comes the mother and the four little girls make baskets with much flourishing of sharp knives jake sells their work from camp to camp all goes well and the squatters seem grateful for their home but one fine day there will be no smoke curling up to the sky no fat black-eyed children scrambling and fighting on the hillside the place will be deserted and jake and his family will have quietly moved on as is the custom of his race in his unencumbered youth jake was a gardener and caretaker for camps up and down the thousand islands but i doubt that his contact with the campers taught him the careful fine courtesy he boasts as i step on the porch he rises and stands hat in hand till i am seated then resumes his grave conversation when we first became acquainted i asked him of his tribe and nation and probably transgressed some law of indian etiquette in doing so for he hesitated some time before answering then my nation he said i am iroquois and the flash in his black eyes and the lift of his old head were fine things to see it was as though a frenchman had said i am a rohan or a scot i am of the clan of argyle our indians of this the charbolate region were not of that bloody aristocracy but of a less warlike race they were the mississauga tribe of the eagle sub-tribe of the ojibbeways of the algonquin stock 
Their origin seems uncertain, but as they took no part in the French and Indian wars, and generally lived at peace with other tribes, it is thought they were descendants of the dispersed neutral nation. Their outstanding figure was Kwaku Okanabe, Peter Jones, chieftain and missionary, who was also their historian. He tells us that the Mississauga were fairly moral before they were corrupted by the whites, were very hospitable, had a high sense of honor, were gentle with children, respectful to the aged, and had a great wish to be thought good, kind, and brave. But they were lazy and provident, very talkative and great newsmongers, and the women were the slaves of their husbands. They believed in a great spirit who was kind and who loved his creatures, in a malevolent spirit who was to be placated, and in innumerable lesser deities. They also had an idea of immortality, for they believed that the warrior lived, after death, in the land of the sun setting. This phrase recurred during the Great War, when the dying Canadian soldier went west. The Indians had definite homes for their gods and spirits. The eagles, or thunderbirds, lived in the La Crochet Mountains. The spirits had several places of abode, one at Burlington Bay, one at River St. Clair, and one at River Credit. These spirits, the Indian fairies, or little people, were usually invisible, but had the power of showing themselves when they wished. They were only two or three feet high, were of human shape, walking erect, and had their faces covered with short, soft hair. The Indians often saw them paddling about in small stone canoes, but they always vanished on finding themselves observed. To the Methodist Church in Canada belongs the credit of raising the Mississauga from paganism and a state of degradation to a high place among Christianized Indians. The Rev. William Case, with other devoted missionaries, went among the Mississauguas of the Bay of Quinte and baptized many converts, among them Chief Kaku Aquanabe, afterwards called Peter Jones. Born in 1802 of a Welsh father and an Ojibwe mother, he was baptized at the Mohawk Church at Brantford, was converted at a camp meeting in 1830, was ordained deacon, then minister of the Wesleyan Methodist Church in Canada, and labored among the Mississauguas and the Ojibwes for 23 years. Communities of Methodist converts soon sprang up among the Grape Island, the River Credit, Rice Lake, Lake Simcoe, and Thames River Indians. And we are told that everywhere Peter Jones, Chief Kakuaquanabe, reached and held the hearts of his people. Traveling long distances over the immemorial land and water trails, the Indians came to the great camp meetings to be baptized by William Case and his co-workers. There seems a singular fitting in these meetings held for the children of the forest, not in churches or houses, but under the shade of trees and beside the rivers they knew and loved. The imagination is fired at thought of those silent redmen learning to sing hymns and to pray to the god of their conquerors in the forests no longer theirs. I like to remember that the men of the Eagle, our Mississauguas, who lived here at many islands, were Christian and peaceable, and lived happily here so long as their nation existed. What became of our Mississauguas? I do not know. The plow turns up their arrowheads and sometimes a bit of clay pottery. Also, Mary Finbar has a beautiful pipe, shaped like an eagle's claw, that was a gift from the chief to her mother, but the Indians are gone. In the office of the Department of Indian Affairs at Ottawa, there is a record of a provisional agreement entered into on the 31st day of May, in the year of our Lord, 1819, between John Ferguson of Kingston, acting on the part and in behalf of His Majesty King George III of the one part, and Nawa Camigo and thirteen other Indians, principal men of the Mississauga Nation. In consideration of the yearly sum of six hundred and forty two pounds ten shillings province currency in goods at the Montreal price to be well and truly paid yearly and every year by his majesty, his heirs and successors, these principal men did freely and voluntarily surrender a tract containing two millions seven hundred and forty eight thousand acres, more or less, to his majesty and his heirs and successors, 
without reservation or limitation in perpetuity. Three years later, these same men made an indenture by which it was agreed that, in consideration of an annuity of two pounds ten shillings of lawful money, of the province aforesaid, to every man, woman, and child of the said Mississauga nation, and to their prosperity forever, provided the number of annuitants should not exceed 257, being the number of persons claiming and inhabiting the said tract of land, these persons freely and voluntarily surrendered this tract of land to His Majesty George the Fourth and his heirs and successors forever. So for the sum of two pounds, ten shillings a year, to be paid to each man, woman, and child, the Mississauguas of Kingston and the Bay of Quinte sold their birthright. We can only hope that the price was well and truly paid to them. End of chapter 17「Chapter Eighteen of Isles of Eden by Laura Lee Davidson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. August nineteenth. Home again to the island and Patricia, this time by motor, for if I travelled to Queensport by milk wagon and stage, I'm never permitted to return that way. We made a detour today, Mary Finbar and I, and drove along the old mast road, going slowly to enjoy its dark coolness. This road was named years ago, when the great pines that grew there were cut and sent to Quebec, and thence to England to become masts for British ships. How beautiful those giant trees must have been! What wild music once sounded in their swaying tops, when the winds of winter went humming through their long needles! The pines along the mast road now are second growth, but the woods are still beautiful. Hemlocks, most graceful of the cone-bearers, sweep the ground with pliant branches, Basswoods cast down their seeds, clusters of small yellow balls hanging to the undersides of paddle-shaped bracts, and along the stream the willows droop toward the water. Tall turtle heads stand on the edge of the swamp, their pinkish-white flowers shaped like a head of a snapping turtle with hooked beak. Big green frogs sit half-submerged in the pools, their little hands, fingers spread, resting on stones or lily pads. They make me think of small bronze images of Buddha. They have the same look of age-long contemplation, of profound repose. The whir of the motor did not disturb them today, nor did it startle the downy woodpeckers clinging to the sides of the trees. They only slipped round the trunks, their crimson nape bands bright spots of color against the somber background of the evergreens. The motor stopped on the crest of a hill overlooking our own lake, and once more I was the pilgrim of chance, hoping for someone to ferry me across to the island. Luck was with me, for William Ferret's motor boat had chosen this shore for one of its periodic breakdowns, and William was working half-heartedly at the bulky engine, swearing softly all the while. One saw that his mind was not on his work. William's mind seldom is, for he has many interests any one of which has power to divert him from the matter in hand. He is a hunter, and the rumor of a deer sets him wandering for days over the countryside. A finder of bee-trees, he is always ready to lead one off into the forest in search of a wild hive. A fisherman, he spends many hours luring bass and doré out of their hiding places. An accomplished woodsman, he is always in demand at woodcutting time, when the beautiful precision with which he can lay a tree low in the very spot selected, and without ruffling a leaf on the sapling standing all about, is a joy to behold. At the mica mine he delights to set off the dynamite when blasting is to be done, and occasionally, very occasionally, he is a farmer. Just now Mr. Ferret is preoccupied with schemes for making a fortune by the manufacture of a cure for the eruption caused by poison ivy being much tormented by the burning and itch of a thorough inoculation, it occurred to him to crush the leaves of a likely-looking plant that he chanced to note in a ramble through the woods, and to apply them to his blisters. The relief, he assured me, was instantaneous, and that was enough for William. He began at once to experiment with the herbs, and found that one variety would cut round the sores while another, of a soothing nature, healed them. Now he is all on fire to market his discovery, 
and is giving away bottles of lotion here and there, asking only a recommend if the stuff works. The process of extracting the precious juices is a secret, but this much William is willing to divulge. They are mashed out, so I suspect that Mrs. Forrett's rolling pin is an important part of the machinery. The profits are certain, the discoverer assures me, his dark eager face all interest, his black eyes alight with enthusiasm. The lotion cost nothing, the herbs growing freely for the gathering, and the bottles, the size of a doctor's bottle, whatever size that may mean, are an inconsiderable trifle, so at the least William counts on clearing twenty-five cents on every bottle sold. Are you not afraid that someone will have your poison ivy cure analyzed and rob you of your discovery? I ask. But he says, no, it would take a bushman to find the plants. Even if he did, judgment is required to determine what proportion of each is needed in the treatment of a given case of infection. If the eruption is slight, then more of the healer should be applied. If severe, then the cutter should preponderate. So there you are. Both science and knowledge of the bush are required, and the combination is so rare as to be little feared. Mr. Forrett has an open mind, one always ready for experiment. One spring he became deeply interested in a thermometer with which I took temperatures when Rose Bulock's baby had pneumonia. I fancy that mine was the only one, except that residing in Dr. LeBaron's inside pocket, that had never been used round many islands. The Bulock's visitors all enjoyed seeing the mercury rise when the bulb was placed under the baby's armpit. Indeed, so many experimented with it that the thermometer was broken at the very height of the disease, when taking of thermometers was most important. Later there was smallpox at the mines, and William Forrett, who has had a thorough case himself, went over to offer his services as nurse. Joe was not so very bad, he told me later. I've seen many a worse. I took his temperature, and it didn't move up at all. How did you do that? I inquired. Did the doctor leave you his thermometer? No, said William, I done it with a milk thermometer, the one that come with the new separator. Jean Ferret, of the snapping black eyes, the high-piled dark hair, the gleaming white teeth, plainly adores her brilliant husband, but she listens to his schemes with a slightly scornful indulgence. She has seen many bright visions dissolve into air, and has done so much hard work while William talked that she is a trifle skeptical. The last time he was about to make a fortune, was by the patenting of a contrivance for preventing cows from switching away flies at milking time. A man gets his face lashed something awful while he is trying to milk, he declares. When Jean was sick and I had to milk, I stood at once, and then I thought out a way to keep the cow's tail clamped to her leg. It worked fine, and I'm going to patent that as soon as I get time, and I bet it sells fine. Yes, says Jeanie, tartly, and it's not until a man has to do the milking that he ever thinks of flies or the cow's tail. A woman can get her eyes switched out, morning and evening, for twenty years, so long as she's the one to handle the cows. I'd be satisfied if he cut me the window in the barn that I've been begging for these ten years and put me in some screens. Then there'd be no flies, and I'd not have to tie down the cow's tail and risk having her kick me and the pail over when she felt bites. William always laughs delightedly at his wife's retorts. He and Jean are plainly the best of friends. After half an hour's rattling and tapping at the engine this afternoon, while I sat waiting on a log, the motor began to run fairly well on one lung, and we chugged away across the lake to where Patricia was fishing from the white skiff. The line of the boat was like the lovely curve of the new moon hanging over the point. The fish are not biting well now, probably because the water swarms with inch-long perch. No bass or doray need take a minnow on a hook when the lake is alive with small fry, free for the swallowing. These tiny creatures swim with flashes of silver as they whisk about, headed now this way, now that, jumping into the air at rhythmic intervals to fall back with a splash and a ripple that makes the surface look as though a brisk shower was passing. Patricia greeted me warmly, but hastily, for she was having a busy time. The only bass of the afternoon was on her hook, had wound the line twice around the anchor rope, dived under the boat, and was jumping away behind her. The rod was curved to the breaking point. The boat was drifting, the fish threatening to make off with hook, sinker, and leader. 
To crown all, two hawks of unknown species were fighting away overhead. The hawks were identified, the fish landed, the line unwound from the anchor, and I climbed aboard. William sped away a few yards and broke down again, and we drifted homeward. Patricia, as always, shows a keen interest in the small happenings of my trip. That is the joy of returning to the island. It is not possible that she can be as interested as she appears in all that concerns her friends, but as a person, to return to Patricia cannot be surpassed. After one of my visits to the metropolis of Queensport, her questions are as eager and her interest as flattering as though I had returned, as by a miracle, from some undiscovered land. She, in turn, had much to relate. Joey Drapeau had come upon a young coon swimming across the lake, had lassoed it with a light rope and towed it ashore, and now held it captive at the farm. A pretty little thing it was, with long soft fur, sharp little black muzzle, and bright eyes. If this were only coon hunting time, its fur would be valuable, for as much as eight dollars was paid last winter for good coon skins. I hoped this little fellow would gnaw himself free and would swim away long before the hunting season. Patricia herself had overtaken a young porcupine swimming rapidly across from Blake's Point to the island, but he got away. Apparently everything here swims with great confidence. Black squirrels, woodchucks, muskrats, coons, porcupines, bears, rabbits, deer. We've seen them all. Uncle Dan Cassidy, with his willow wand, had at last found a spring on Henderson's Point, and the well digger from Kingston had come with his drill to bore for water. The last item of news was that Rose Bulak had paid a visit to the island, ostensibly to bring us some frog's legs, but really to find out what I wanted to say when I last went to the Bulaks. Alas, I had missed her again. Indeed, there was so much to talk about that we lingered while the sun, like a red balloon, went down in a copper-colored sky. The clouds, red, purple, and golden, were reflected in the still water. The sunset glory faded, leaving only the purple that turned the water dark wine red. And when our lake looks like that, I understand the meaning of Homer's wine-dark sea. A loon, swimming rapidly, left a long silver wake, and darting water beetles cut gleaming lines crisscross on the pools. They made me think of small, swift shuttles weaving a silver web. End of chapter 18Chapter 19 of Isles of Eden by Laura Lee Davidson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. August 23rd. Summer is dying. Fall comes on apace. There are long red branches on the sumacs and dogwoods. Patches of butter yellow lie on the basswoods, and the leaves of the wild sarsaparilla are golden. Yellow splotches lie also on the floor of the woods, for the first light frost colored the fronds of the ferns, so that even far back in the deepest shade, sunlight seems to be gilding the ground. Closed gentians are blooming on the moist shore trail, in the selfsame spot where they appear every year, dwelling in still, secluded places, standing stiffly erect with tight-closed lips that open only when the heavy bumblebee forces them. The closed gentian is the very flower of reticence, but it too manages to give its silent warning of the approach of fall. Flocks of young black ducks are paddling about, feeding on the seeds, insects, and clams in the shallow water. They are convoyed by anxious parents, and when alarmed, the old birds leave the water and skitter off with a great flapping of white-lined wings. The young ones, who have not learned to skim the surface, plow along rapidly in long agitated lines. At sunset these duck families swim along the shores and in and out of the coves, looking for a safe place to sleep, and we steal after them in the canoe, hoping to surprise them and gain a knowledge of their shelters. We never do, for silent as we think we are, slow and cautious as is our approach, the old birds always catch sight of us and go thrashing and flapping away. Almost every flock of barnyard ducks here is crossed with the wild duck, the young black ducks stray away from their flocks, or the parents are killed. Someone finds the little creatures, pens them, and feeds them corn, and gradually they merge with the tame ones, and the result is a breed of slender, sharp-headed, strange-looking fowl, 
half wild, half tame, whose wings must be kept clipped, or away they fly when they hear the quack of their kin, or see the wavering lines of wild ducks going over the lake. The game laws, posted carefully on the cabin doors, say that duck shooting does not begin here until September the 15th, but in the minds of the hunters hereabout it begins on the 1st. On that date we are always awakened by loud popping of guns. At the moment the first streak of yellow appears in the eastern sky. After that we see no more ducks on the water. They fly high over the lake, seeming to know that the 1st of September has come. A sparrowhawk visited the island this morning, and during his stay all the little warblers, creepers, and flycatchers hid themselves. The woods were as still as the spirit of death that hovered in the treetops. Only the kingbird, most intrepid of fighters, seemed to feel no fear. We saw him dashing about, and soon the hawk fled away across the lake, flying high and going rapidly, a darting vicious little enemy in full pursuit, until both were lost to sight in Drapeau's woods. After a while the kingbird returned, with an air of having performed a pleasant duty, and settled on a branch to watch for flying insects or perhaps another hawk or a crow. Droll little bird policemen they are, with their gray coats, white waistcoats, square tails with a white border, and their orange-colored spot on the crown of the head. They will not be here to guard us much longer, for soon they and the hawks will be leaving. Already we see numbers of the big birds soaring over the lake. They are congregating for their fall migration. Presently they and we will be gone. Rose Bulock is very ill. The neighborhood knows it because everyone along the phone line heard the frantic call that went out from the mines for Dr. LeBaron in Queensport. The news reached us last, for we have no telephone and heard it only when we went to the Blake's farm last evening for the milk. It was nearly dark when we set out on the long row up the lake and across Loon Bay to offer help if, perchance, Rose were still alive. A north wind whistled in our faces. The waves ran high and rowing was hard. As we turned into the bay, one point of light shone across the black water from the lamp in the ill woman's window, and by its spark we steered our way between the rocks and through the lashing waves at the shore. The hillside was overgrown with tansy, we stumbled here and there through the tangle, crushing the leaves and yellow buttons of flower heads underfoot as we searched for the path. The rank weedy odor clung to our woolen skirts and grew stronger when we went into the hot house. Tansy, herb of the Passover, Lenten fair of the old church, bitter herb indeed it was, growing to the very doorstone of that poor home in which a mother lay dying. The one room downstairs was crowded with children and with silent waiting men. The hounds had crept in and were lying close to their master's feet, watching with soft, mournful eyes. John Bulak sat beside the cradle, trying to soothe the baby's fretful wails. Rose lay in the loft in a stupor that looked like death. There are four double beds in that room under the roof that measures twelve by fourteen feet. Two, set foot to foot, are pushed against each side wall with a narrow space like the aisle of a sleeping car between them. At one end there is a steep ladder that does duty for a staircase, and there is a small window under the peak of the roof at the other end. Nine persons, child and adult, sleep under that low roof. By the light of a flickering lamp I described four women at Rose's bed, Nora McCulley, Jean Ferret, and Billy Bulak's wife, standing. At the foot sat Mrs. Trapeau, Rose's old mother, her bent white head coughed in a little black shawl. She looked like a watching fate, worn and sorrowful. Through the gloom I made out also the outline of Rose's small, drawn face on the pillow. She was alive. She had pulled through, but it had been a desperate chance. She knew me wanderingly. I've been on a long journey, she whispered, and I've climbed many hills, but I've come home. I know where I be now. Remembering her duty to a guest, she urged that someone set me a chair. Then her eyes closed, and Mrs. Drapeau waved us out of the room. Rose had been hanging out a heavy wash that morning, poor soul, when the hemorrhage came, and had only strength to climb up the ladder to her bed, before sending two of the children over the fields for help. The little boys ran crying and calling along the road to the point, 
and screamed across the water to Mrs. Drapeau. She heard them and hurried to her boat, leaving the churn with the butter coming, as she told me, when describing her panic, and reached her daughter just in time, while the little boy sped along the mica trail to the mine and the telephone. Nora McCulley hastened at top speed to the rescue, and the fight for Rose's life began. The efforts to stop the flow of blood that could scarce be staunched, the endeavor to call the dying woman back out of the stupor from which it grew harder and harder to wake her, it was an heroic fight, but the women worked on doggedly. Billy Bulak's wife had left a young baby at home in the care of its seven-year-old brother, but when Mrs. Drapeau remonstrated and would have sent her back to feed it, she shook her head. My baby will cry for me, but it'll not die. I'll not leave you till the doctor comes, she said, and stay she did until the boat ground on the stones, and Dr. LeBaron came striding up the path. When I went back today, carrying fresh linen, wine, and milk for the ill woman, I found the house quiet. Rose was better. Blackjack and Louis Bulak were busy moving the stove out of the doors, so that the rooms might be cooler. I never grow used to the casual housekeeping of people like the Bulaks, nor to seeing the potatoes boiling away merrily under the open sky, half the time with the rain falling into the pot. Cecily was trotting busily between the stove and the house. Her dark eyes were swollen with watching or tears. She looked smaller and younger than she has of late. Apparently she had reverted to her former state of servitude in the household. Gone were the pink silk blouse and elaborate coiffure, the transparent stockings, the high-heeled shoes. She wore an old brown gingham frock, none too clean, her heavy dark hair hung in the rough plate down her back, and she pattered about on bare brown feet. "'Your mother will need you for some time. You will stay close at home for a while, won't you, Cecily?' I said. She kept her eyes averted and jerked away from me. Was she going to stay, or was she only waiting for a summons, as the neighbors all predicted, when she would leave and join Charlie in the West? End of chapter 19「Chapter Twenty of Isles of Eden by Laura Lee Davidson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. August twenty seventh. Fruit hangs ripe on every plant. The dogwood berries are blue on their crimson stems. The shinleaf and Canadian mayflower are loaded with clusters of dark berries, and the seed balls of the wild sarsaparilla are shining black. Heavy bunches of wild grapes lie over the rocks, ripening in the sun, and tiny cones all over the cedars are tawny brown and turn straight upward toward the sky. The nights are cold, and soon we shall have to leave our sleeping shacks in the woods and move to the main house, where the sun all day and the fire in the evening can warm us. I hate to leave those sleeping shacks. So many summer rains, so many winter snows have fallen on those little dwellings that their sloping roofs are moss-grown, and their green stain has so faded and mellowed that they sink into the colors of the forest, and seem as much a part of the woods as the trees themselves, or the bird's nest that hang in the crotches of the bushes. I wish I might den in when cold weather approaches, as the bears and chipmunks do, to sleep until spring comes round again. In the cool, damp nights the wood spiders creep in and sit motionless on walls and beams, with bodies the size of hazelnuts and eight long, hairy legs spread out to the circumference of the top of a teacup. They look as poisonous and as formidable as tarantulas, but they are harmless, very sluggish, and easily killed. If they are within reach, a blow from a shoe finishes them. If too high on the ceiling, we have recourse to the spider stick, a long thin board with a flat end, with which Patricia jabs unerringly. We have learned to regard these insects with indifference, at least she has and I have even schooled myself to go to sleep with one sitting in an inaccessible corner of the roof, for I know he will be sitting there next morning when daylight shows me where to aim my blow. The spiders all over the island are an industrious folk, and spin their bright webs across every path. When we come out of doors in the early mornings, a fairy network all over the bushes shines and glances in the sunlight like weavings of spun glass. 
the water spiders are more intimidating than those of the land, for to their size and general hideousness they add an uncanny ability to swim with great rapidity, so that to throw one overboard does nothing to dishearten him. He only turns, swims straight back, and climbs aboard again, to hide behind a thwart or under the wash tub. We do our laundry on the dock, dipping the linen up and down in the lake to rinse it, and hanging it on a line, stretched between birch and poplar, where it dries in the checkered shade and sunshine. There are those that profess to consider washing a hardship, and perhaps from the standpoint of the city dweller it is, but to sit on one's heels on the edge of this dock, with the blue lake lying before and the green curve of the shore at one's back, to dip the pails in the clear water, where the sunfish dart away, or a fat bass goes foraging by, to forget work and dream while the dock swings gently on its anchor chains. Well, that is happiness enough for me on any bright morning. This dock is a moss-grown platform of wide boards, floated on big cedar logs and weathered a lovely gray. The sky reaches over it, the water stretches away before it, around the edges of the cove that shelters it, the alders and willow hang over the banks. Today the laundry work ended in disaster, for Patricia attempted to wash her clothes and catch minnows, all the while watching for strange birds, and the combination of activities did not work. She spread the minnow net on the sand of the harbor, baited it, then filled the wash tub and began soaping vigorously. Then her attention wandered, being drawn to an unfamiliar warbler in a bush, and she turned back to the net to see a catfish swimming off with a long brown silk stocking left hanging over the side of the dock. In her excitement she threw the bird glasses overboard in eight feet of water, and immediately the woods resounded with our lamentations. We dredged up the glasses with a landing net, but the catfish never came back with the stocking, and, discouraged, we left the clothes in the tub and went fishing, only to catch the same turtle every time we threw in a hook. Turtles are the fishermen's bane. They drift along slowly, their heads, that look like the ends of floating sticks, just showing above the surface. They sink, without a ripple, to nibble off minnow after minnow, while the hopeful angler goes on baiting, sure that he has at least a perch, when, behold, he is catching only an old mud turtle. They sun themselves on floating logs, big snappers, some fifteen or eighteen inches across the shell, weighing many pounds, or tiny ones the size of a half dollar, and when a boat approaches they slip, one after another, over the far sides of the logs with a splash. Useful for nothing else, they are good scavengers, and the old moss-covered one that lives under the dock keeps the harbor clean by eating the fish skins we throw overboard. But whether turtles steal the bait, or catfish make off with silk stockings, it is pleasant to row along the islands in the afternoons, to feel the warm sun on one's shoulders, to watch the spotted sandpipers running nimbly along the beaches. What neat, dignified little birds they are, and with what an air of confidence and self-possession do they attend to their business in life. Along the old rail fence-tops and in the furrows of Drapeau's ploughed land, their plaintive peat wheat sounds incessantly. To and fro they go on the run, stopping short now and again to balance on their thin stilts. At sunset every clear evening, six little sandpipers start out from the shore of Blake's Island, and go winging away up the lake. Where they go, why they go, no one knows, but so regular is their vesper journey that we wait to see them before we too start out for our evening paddle for the milk. This is the last moon that I shall see over many islands. The next will rise for me over the tops of houses, and will shine at the ends of ugly streets. Then the sight of it will send a pang of yearning to my heart, and I shall not want to look at it. But here the nights are all too short to show the beauty of the moon. The clump of birches at my cabin door stands white as marble, and every leaf on every fern shows black as ink along the paths. All night long the loons sound their beautiful bugle calls, and the herons squawk as they flap across the lake. The deer mice scurry through the leaves, the red squirrel patters across the roof, and underneath all these night sounds I hear the rhythmic rise and fall of the water like the breathing of a quiet sleeper. The time for farewells approaches. I begin with the moon last night, 
leaving the lighted cabin and Patricia to wander off to the shore, drawn as always by the call of the dark forest. The round silver shield stood over the pines on the doctor's island. The trees were black velvet, the water dark and swiftly moving, with a wash of silver round every stone. A broad shining highway stretched across the lake to our shore, and on it a loon rode the ripple like a little dark canoe. A heron stood upright on the beach, an inky silhouette. I sat in the cleft of a rock, the bright lake at my feet, the forest behind me. The water whispered as it splashed against the stones, the leaves whispered as the breeze shook them, the stems of the birches were ghost-like in the shadows, and through thin places in the foliage the moonlight filtered down, dappling the ferns with silver. I was at peace with the world. I saw the beauty of the night as in a dream. Suddenly my languor left me. I sat upright, on guard. The woods seemed no longer friendly, nature no longer kind. The air, lately so still, seemed filled with murmuring voices, signaling from one shadow to the next. The trees seemed full of small, peering eyes, and all were watching me. From very far away sounded the call of a loon, lonely and wild, and suddenly, without reason or excuse, I was afraid. I felt the terror of the woods, the fear we name for Pan, the panic terror. I imagined a presence just behind my shoulder, moving as I moved, but keeping just out of sight. There was an aromatic odor in the air. Was it the fennel that I smelled? The hair on my neck began to prickle, and I shivered, though the night was warm. I knew that I was not alone. There was another presence in the forest, august and sinister. Was it Pan? Just as I determined to retreat to the house, but to do so in a dignified manner, as befitted a civilized person, to whom the old goat god and his fear were but curious myths, Something brushed my face, a huge dark shape drifted over my head, and a sharp sudden cry sounded in the silence. I knew it was an owl, I knew I was a fool, but I fled along the path to the house, tripping over roots, dashing against trees as though Pan himself were after me, and arrived, shaken and breathless, on the porch where the friendly lamplight shone out reassuringly. Patricia looked up from her book. I perceive you have been mooning, she said. What frightened you this time? Did you think you heard a bear or a bobcat? I did not answer, for I was ashamed to tell her that Pan had driven me home. End of chapter 20「Isles of Eden」by Laura Lee Davidson This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. August 31st Migrating birds are coming in flocks to the islands, great mixed companies of them, all gathering for their long journey to the south. What tiny things they are to travel so far! They fly at night very high in the sky, and when I am wakeful I think of them. So many little brave hearts, beating, beating as the myriads of bird voyagers go steadily onward, turning ever to the south. The black poles make the longest journey, for they nest in Alaska and go all the way through the West Indies and the Bahamas to winter in Venezuela and Brazil. It takes them a month to go a thousand miles, and in the last two weeks of the journey they sometimes fly at a speed of two hundred miles a day. In the bright moonlight, the herons squawk all night. We see many of them now, for they too are gathering for their fall migration. The great blue herons are pictures when they perch on the topmost branch of some ragged pine. Black against the sky, or standing stiffly upright on the beaches like old weathered stumps of driftwood. They feed along the shores, rise from the swamps, sometimes with a frog hanging from their bills, and go flapping away over the lake, their long necks crooked back in a hump, their legs stretched straight out behind and hooked together by the toes. As the days grow colder, the wild folk of the island draw nearer to the houses, sensing perhaps the approaching helplessness of winter when the snows will shut them in. 
At sunrise the grouse came down over the hill to feed on the shad and partridge berries under the dry leaves. I am waked by soft, gurgling clucks and the scratch of wary bird footsteps, but if I raise my head ever so quietly to look out of the window over my bed, there is silence. Every bird freezes instantly, and when I know that the whole covey is squatting motionless under the brakes, not a feather can be seen. So perfectly does the streaked, mottled plumage match the twig-covered ground. If I catch a gleam from one beady black eye, the situation becomes a staring match and test of patience, with the odds in favor of the bird. As long as I look, so long will he, motionless, scarce breathing, but if I weary and glance away for one instant, he is gone. When I look back, I have lost him, and meanwhile the whole covey has fled. These are the Canadian ruffed grouse, the best game birds of Ontario, and found almost all over the province. They are not migratory, and unless driven away a few miles by scarcity of food or by brush fires, they live out their little day in one neighborhood, and short indeed their day is, for they have many enemies. Whenever I walk along the island trails, I find round, bare spots in the ground, the grouse's dusting places, and back in the bushes I hear the soft clucking of mother grouse leading their young in the hunt for ants' eggs, larvae, or birch buds, and from beside my very feet the male grouse rises like a rocket and goes thrashing away through the trees, and my heart jumps at the sound. I've never found a grouse's nest, although I hunted them many a spring day. Doubtless I almost walked over them, hidden beside fallen logs, never seen them or the down-covered chicks almost under my feet. But often I heard the roll of the male grouse's drum as he sounded the call to his mate. Far away in the woods I knew he was standing on a log or high rock, body erect, tail spread, rough raised, strong winds beating the air with a noise like distant thunder, and my heart would beat wildly in answer to the thrilling sound. Our poor grouse will suffer the winter, I fear, in the talons of the lynx, for disease having carried off the hares, the big tree-climbing cats will be hunting the birds and all other helpless things. I hope the brush piles here and there in the woods will serve as places of refuge. The bobcat, horrid creature with his big furry feet, short hairy tail, long black-tipped ears, and snarling savage yowl is the farmer's pest devouring lambs and young pigs and robbing the hen-houses. But in spite of his savage looks, the lynx is a coward, and there is no authentic record of his ever having attacked man. When fall draws near, Jean Ferret always refuses flatly to allow anyone to take her by a shortcut through the drowned lands to the open lake, for fear that a bobcat will drop on her from some overhanging limb. Everyone here believes this to be the habit of the bobcat, confusing him, perhaps, with a wolverine, cunning and ferocious, who is said to wait in a tree overhanging a runway, ready to drop on the deer passing beneath. Thank heaven we have no wolverines here. Farewell visits are in order now. I begin with the Bulax, farthest away and hardest to reach, lest stormy weather at the last prevent my going. Never did our lake look so blue, the shore so emerald green the gray rocks veined with mica, so diamond bright in the sunshine as in these first days of fall. In the frosty mornings the air is bleakly clear and everything has a sharp and flashing edge. Along the shores the kingfishers dart out from their perches on snags of driftwood, dash into the water and emerge with a wriggling fish hanging from their sword-like bills. Austerely handsome birds they are, with their black crests, blue-gray backs, and bright chestnut-colored bands crossing white breasts. They give a warning rattle as they fly, and Rufus, the red squirrel, perched on a moosewood branch, thrusts forward his impudent little rust-colored head and mimics them exactly. When I reached the Bulax today, Rose was sitting out of doors in the sunshine, propped up in the one rocking chair. She looked thin and weak, like the spirit's playmate, as Nora McCulley would have said. The hillside swarmed with children, ranging in size from the one-year-old baby creeping on the ground among the hens, to stout 
fourteen-year-old Sally May, who was hanging out a forlorn wash on the bushes. Well, Sessie's gone, Rose announced presently with a sigh. We'll miss her bad this winter. I don't know what I'll do without her, though Sally May is a smart good girl at home, too. It had come. The neighbors had been right. Cecily had run away. Gone, I echoed. Oh, Mrs. Bulak, why did you let her go? Couldn't you have stopped her somehow? No, said Rose, wiping her eyes. A smart girl like Cecily should ought to have her chance. She's never been nowhere to see nothing, living here all her life by this lake. She ought to get away and have some fun and maybe learn something, but I'll miss her terrible this winter. But what kind of chance can she have away from all her people? Mrs. Bulak, you don't know what may happen to her. Try to get her to come home. I did not wish to mention Charlie. No need to publish poor Cecy's shame. The woman she's to live with is awful nice, Rose went on, disregarding my words. We had a letter from Cecy yesterday, telling that the house is grand, carpets on the floors and stair steps going up and all. Woman, what woman, I demand it, not one whit reassured. Why, the preacher's wife, down to Frontenac, Rose answered. Helen Henderson, Jason's sister, lived with her for three years before she got married. Ever since she left, she's been trying to get Cecy the place, but there was another girl had it, so we had to wait. Ellen says the woman's real good and fine to her help. It ain't like Cecy's gone to strangers. Ellen's there to see to her, and she'll let us know if everything's not right. I drew a long breath. Here was the solution, simple and sensible, of which I had never thought. Ah, how I hope that Cecily will be content, and that the awful kind woman will be patient when waves of homesickness engulf her little maid. When Cecily is dull and inattentive, how will her mistress guess that in thought the girl is away again on a frozen lake, breaking under the dark March sky, that she is lying once more on the tilting flow, seeing a man's drowned face coming up through the black water. When she is sullen and rebellious, doing her work with careless haste, will the preacher's good wife be able to imagine that Cecily is standing in again beside the lilac bush, hearing her lover's voice pleading in the moonlight? Time to say goodbye. John rose and hobbled painfully into the house to reach down a great sack hanging over a beam. It contained a deerskin saved carefully from moth and dust against this moment of parting. Lay it beside your bed and put your feet on it in the cold mornings, he said. This is but the beginning of the gifts I gather everywhere that I go to say farewell. Here a gay little dish for butter, there a fat brown tea pot, again a big cake of maple sugar or a silver breast pin, in shape the maple leaf to remind me of Canada. I take them all with a swelling heart, these evidences of the kindness that has followed me, winter and summer, when every neighbor became a friend. Goodbye, goodbye, I pushed off from the shore, leaving a row of little bulacks all standing with toes in the water, while John and Rose waved from a hill. Take care of yourself. Come back next year, they called. Yes, yes, next year. I promised, and as I rounded the point, I heard the piping child voices, still screaming, shrill as the loons themselves. End of chapter 21「twenty two of Isles of Eden by Laura Lee Davidson This LibriVox recording is in the public domain September first The bittersweet that twines the whole island is hung thick with orange colored balls. Here and there one of these capsules has crinkled back to thrust forward a bright red arrow that contains a seed. A lovely vine it is with pale green leaves and tendrils that wave and swing. They are waiting for some wandering wind to blow them near a neighboring bush, where instantly they will grasp a twig and then begin to climb. Then that bush is doomed, for the bittersweet is the worst of parasites, twisting and choking until finally it has killed the plant that harbored it. I am always stopping as I go through the woods to unwind the bittersweet from some young sapling of birch or maple. 
Everywhere I go now the men are talking of deer. The hunting season is still far off. Even when it comes, only one deer may be shot by each hunter, and the bring down of that one is always doubtful. Nevertheless, guns are being cleaned and oiled, and conversations are all about deer heard, deer seen, deer shot, deer missed, and in every eye is the hunting glare. I go to the Blakes to hear that the cows are all standing alert in the pasture. Heads up, ears pricked, signs of a deer somewhere in neighboring woods. At the drapeaux, a trampled place beside the haymow in the lower field, shows that a deer slept there last night. Someone brings tidings of the doe that summers on Long Island at the mouth of Lost Bay, where she comes every year in May or June to rear her young. She has been seen stepping timidly down to the shore at dusk to drink, her two little spotted fawns tripping along beside her. Everyone promises me venison if I stay on at many islands this winter, and everyone will have a deerskin to sell me when I come back next spring. Alas, the red deer that used to overrun Ontario are fast disappearing, and unless carefully protected, soon there will be no more. Not very long ago they roamed the province, but settlers came, clearing the land, railroads were built, and there are cities now where the forest once stood. Forest fires, wolves, crust hunters, repeating rifles, all conspired to exterminate them. And so the red deer are almost gone. But William Ferret still counts on one a season, and somehow there is a haunch of venison at most houses here in the fall. In summer the deer's coat is bright rust color, thin and useless. As autumn approaches, it deepens to gray until in October and November it is almost mouse color, and the deer is said to be in the blue. Then is the right time for tanning it into soft, fine leather, and that is the only lawful color for a deerskin rug. Now that the nights are cold and dews heavy, horny, many-footed, naked brown worms begin creeping across the paths and into the sleeping shacks, where they cling to the walls and rafters. They are sometimes as thick as small lead pencils and as long as a finger. When disturbed, they curl round in a whorl and drop with a tap to the floors. Preparation for the night begins with a search by candlelight for these crawling interlopers. The knocking of them down and the casting of them forth into the woods, lest they curl up and drop on beds in the darkness and, perchance, on the face of a sleeper. They are very sluggish hardly seeming to move at all, but somehow they travel, for we find them everywhere. William Ferret loves to tell of a trick played in the lumber camp when one of these worms was dropped into a pot of boiling coffee, and twelve, mayhap fifteen, husky lumberjacks died in strong convulsions after drinking that poisoned brew. It was not a camp in which William himself was working, but he heard about it and believes it. I may have doubts, but the tale does nothing to recommend these unpleasant worms to me. The fishing is over. Bass and Doré have retired to sequestered holes and will not emerge until two or three weeks later, when the September rains are over. Only pike, horrid snake-like fish with yawning mouths and evil eyes can be caught now. They swallow the hooks, fight the landing nets, drag away to the bottom, and when finally subdued and brought to the boat, have to be clubbed on the head and thrown away, for the pike in this lake are diseased and cannot be eaten. They are small cousins to the muscalunge, the fierce game fish of the St. Lawrence and Thousand Island districts, and in neighboring lakes grow to great size, sometimes measuring thirty-six inches in length and weighing twenty to twenty-five pounds. With only pike to catch, Patricia has packed away reels, rods, bait pails, and landing nets, with lingering care, and, never at a loss for occupation, is happily painting buckets. The color of goldenrod always brings to my thoughts the picture of a shaded, birch-pillared porch with a long row of water pails painted that bright yellow. Long ago the paint, gallons of it, were sent from Toronto as a floor stain. We thought it a queer mistake of the dealers, not knowing then that many of the kitchen floors of rural Ontario are of this cheerful tint. The paint was set aside until one day all the tin water pails began to rust, 
and a nautical guess suggested giving them a coat of paint, as is done on shipboard. Thereafter, yellow buckets became a camp tradition, and every season Patricia gives them all another coat before they are stored away against the winter's dampness. Unknowing persons often smile at our rows of filled water pails. With a large lake at hand, why so much water standing on the island, they inquire. But I remember the day when, like the Roman geese, those filled water buckets saved our citadel. One afternoon in a late October, when I was alone on the island, I emptied the hot ashes from the stove, and, with the imbecility of a tenderfoot, threw them into a wooden box, set that on the porch, and went my way. Ten minutes later, smelling smoke, I rushed back to find the kitchen wall ablaze. There was no time to work the pump, no time to climb up and down the cliff to the lake for water, and but for the filled pails so conveniently near, the camp in the woods would have burned to the ground. Therefore I never complain at any number of trips to the pump, remembering that anxious moment, and since then I have borne on my escutcheon a bucket rampant in a blazing box. Not permitted to assist in the painting, I wandered off over the fields of mainland to the Hendersons to say farewell. I passed along the wagon road between the stubble fields and the corn, where the men were cutting, and Jason threw down his knife and strode to the fence to greet me. Our goodbye said he lingered. There seemed something on his mind. So Sessie Bulock's away to Frontenac, I hear, he observed. I was over to Little John's yesterday, and they told me she was gone. She's a good girl, Sessie, and she did well by her mother and the kids. I'll be running down to the town to see my sister Ellen, the one that's married to the Cockney chap, you know, and I'll stop in to the preacher's house and take the girl to a picture now and again. Suddenly I saw a light. Jason, I demanded, did you have anything to do with sending Cecily away from many islands? He picked up a small stone, examined it carefully, turning it over and over in his big hand, aimed it at a woodchuck that was sitting at its door in the field behind us, and threw it with precision. The woodchuck disappeared in its burrow, and Jason faced me squarely. In a couple of years I'm going to marry her, he announced. I leaned across the fence, and we shook hands solemnly. She'll never find a better man, I said, with conviction. Jason grinned. She'll maybe get a worse, he said. I'd ought to know something about taking care of a family, he went on with rather a bitter smile. I've had enough of it to do, looking after mother and our young ones, besides my brother Henry's, too, that was wished on us. Poor mother's had a hard time, too, but the girl that marries me will have it easier. In a couple of years I'll have everything paid off. She can have help in the house, and with the little car she can get away to town now and again for a day. Life on a farm is hard on women, he went on soberly. That's why I want, when I get married, to take a girl from round many islands that knows what she's getting into, and not one from town that will get discontented and maybe run away on me after the first winter. But I want one, too, that knows how to keep a house right and make things look good and Cessy will get good training at the preacher's house. She'll see how things ought to be did. What about Cecily's love affair with Charlie McDade, I ventured? Jason dismissed poor Charlie with a jerk of his thumb. There was nothing at all to that, he said. Cessy's all right, but girls is all the same when it comes to a gabby fellow like McDade. She took to him for a bit, like all girls will, but when she's lived in town a while and seen other men, He'll be the same as last year's bird nest to her. He'll stay west for some time, for I only loaned him enough to get as far as Moose Jaw, and he'll never do enough work to get him home. He'll stay out there until spring. Then I'll send him a return ticket, and by then Cessie will have forgotten him. What about his wife and children, I asked? Who will take care of them? Well, Margaret should ought to have a rest, too, said Jason. She's never had much of a one with Charlie. She'll do all right for the winter. The crops are in, such as they be, and the neighbors will catch her fish to salt down when the herring run begins, and the men will cut her wood. Nobody starves round many islands. I can let her have a couple of pigs myself. 
How simple it was, after all. The mine whistle blew for noon, and the men began straggling across the field toward the house. Well, take care of yourself, said Jason. Good luck, and I hope you keep your good health. Along the wood road I wandered back to the lake. Purple asters, goldenrod, and bouncing bet were growing everywhere. I sat a while on a pile of boards at Jason's sawmill that stands in a grove of cedars, watched the red squirrels race over the logs, and smelled the fragrance of fresh-cut pine and hemlock. Across the meadows and cornfields, the lake shone silver in the sunlight. End of chapter 22「Chapter Twenty Three of Isles of Eden by Laura Lee Davidson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. September fifth. By this first week in September, the autumn rains and gales are due. The wind roars and sings down the lakes. The white-capped waves run high. The driftwood pounds on the beaches, and the sand is strewn with long wreaths of yellow foam. The fishermen find no anchorage, and their small flat-bottomed boats rock and drift in the shifting gusts. Rain falls day after day, steadily, drearily. The ground is sodden, crystal beads hang from the tips of the leaves, the ferns droop, the reeds bow their heavy heads, and the paths are rivulets. We hurry along under dripping trees, and every swinging bunch of leaves drops a handful of cold water down the backs of our necks. Along the borders of the wet meadows, the jewelweed is frosted under the rain. Silverleaf is, in truth, and soon will be the touch-me-not, for every full pod, like a miniature gun, stands ready to burst at the lightest touch, and sends its seeds far along the highway. Now the leaf fall really begins, and the ground is covered with the yellow banners of birches and basswoods that shine golden under the rain. Wide vistas are opening in the woods, and through them we can see the gray lake from which a heavy mist is rising. We build roaring fires, and the cabin reeks with steam. We pack away our clothes and wooden chests at night, so as to have something dry to wear next day. We take raincoats and sou'westers to bed with us, and are generally depressed and uncomfortable. But oh, the good smell of the wet earth and wood smoke sifting through the rain, and the fragrance of drenched cedars, those tall green mounds that shelter so many bedraggled vireos, song sparrows and chickadees, sitting huddled far in against the trunks, forlorn little bunches of damp feathers. The robins are the only birds that seem not to mind the rain, for they whistle and call through the heaviest downpour, perched on high branches of poplars or maple, turning their copper-colored breasts to catch the light, puffy out their feathers. They make me think of stout little gentlemen, determined to make the best of a bad business. Doubtless they know, as we do, that this rough and blustering weather will not last long. Some morning at sunrise the rain will stop, a beam of light will strike in through a knot-hole. We shall hear once more the patter of the red squirrel's hard little claws on the roof. The trees will stop dripping, and life will take on her fairest colors. Then will come calm and golden days to last until November, and I shall not be here. Once I saw the full circle of the year go round in these islands. I was here when blue October walked the hills on a carpet of crimson and gold. I heard the faraway horns of autumn blowing in the November gales. The snow shut me in, the ice came, and turned the lake into a shining floor for my slipping, stumbling feet, and I saw the forest wake to life when spring came through the land. I know it all so well. I know just where the closed gentian always waits in the path along the cliffs, where the tall turtle-head always stands in the swamps, and the clearing where the little knee-high cedars climb the slopes like groups of green-clad children hurrying to a party. How many a time, when walking the short island trails, have I suddenly realized that my feet were pressing on beloved ground? How often, passing a young birch, have I, all unconsciously, laid my hand on its white bark as one touches the face of a child that is dear? 
it is hard to leave the island. Round and round I go saying my farewells. I lean my head against the white oak's scaly, fissured bark and marvel at the sumac's scarlet sprays. I listen to the whisper of the rushes on the low point. I climb to the high rock once more to look out on the wide lake and sky and catch, perchance, the memory of great moments there when to me it seemed that the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Through the long cold evenings we sit before the fire planning next summer's delights. We pass lightly over the coming winter, and our thoughts, la grande fret, comes like a dream, and we are back with the spring, on this our island of content. The big shack, with bunks piled high with gay pillows, its deep chairs, long writing table, and many books, is warm and homelike. All sorts of trophies are tacked on its yellow walls. Old nests, empty turtle shells, dried dragonflies, bright feathers picked up in the woods, and butterfly wings that the birds have clipped off neatly and dropped in our paths. There is the skin of the white muskrat, found in William Forrett's traps one winter, and a pair of loon's wings, dark and strong, standing gloriously erect. Loon's wings and muskrat skin must soon be laid away carefully against another summer. Indeed, our packing is almost done. We have fairly earned the right to sit by the fire and dream. Each log as it burns sends forth a perfume and brings to my mind a picture. The sticks of wild cherry smell like flowers. And while they flame, I see the woods of spring, with trees all white like a bride's bouquet, and I smell the cherry blossoms. Red cedar has an odor like sandalwood and sends my thoughts away across the hills of winter, where velvet evergreens stand massed against the snow. A branch of driftwood roars and snaps, and instantly I am in the white skiff, running into shore where, drenched with wind-whipped spray, the bones of dead forest trees lie bleached and twisted and bare. A sheet of birch bark flares and hisses, sending out a pungent resinous scent, and once more I am looking out through my cabin door at a clump of fairy trees, silver-white in the moonlight. Ah, me! What combination of pipes and furnaces, what city fires could ever bring up pictures like these, or set one dreaming so? I look across the hearth toward Patricia. Her busy hands lie idle in her lap, for she is dreaming too. The fine tell-tale lines of care and sorrow that marked her face two months ago are smoothed away. Her blue eyes are clear, her look serene. She is a new, a happier Patricia. The last morning has come. Each smallest task is done. The green canoe is waiting to carry us away. Across the bay we see Henry Blake rowing to see us off and close the camp. On the far shore, a white cloth waves in an energetic hand. Mary is saying goodbye, good luck for another year. At Loon Lake, we rest on our paddles and turn for one last look. An eagle rises suddenly from his perch on the top of a tall dead tree and soars on wide wing across the cloudless sky, his white head flashing in the sun. Here and there on the shores a sugar maple flames like a torch against the evergreens. There lies the island, anchored in a silver lake. There stands the little house on the gray cliff, and already they look very far away, withdrawn into a shining place of peace and happy dreams. End of chapter 23 End of Isles of Eden by Laura Lee Davidson